I'd like to do a quick caption check just to ensure that our captions are going in since we've switched. I'd like to do a quick caption check just to ensure. And you guys are all going to get an echo. There we go. So I have my captions turned on on the video. Are we captioning currently? Um, yep, they are coming through. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome to WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Jay McKay, and I'm the Director of Community Programs at Nobility. Thank you for joining us for our next session, Think Smart and Adapt, Meeting WCAG2 Without Rebuilding from Scratch, with Mike Zemak from Cut to Code. Uh, Mike has been on quite a journey. He's fond of new technologies, computer games, and good music. After graduating from conservatory, he was working as a singer and a music teacher, and then spent a year working as a creative director for a boutique e-commerce photo studio before falling in love with uh, WordPress. So I'm really excited for today's session. Uh, please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A tab in Slido, and we will answer them at the end of the session, and then use, use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. Hello, everyone. It's so great to have you. My name is Mike, and I'm a project manager at cut to code um, Just let me quickly introduce our company. We are a web development agency, and we create WordPress sites and Shopify stores. We work with a broad range of clients, starting from universities and research companies from the US, chemistry Nobel Prize laureates, local communities, upcycling brands, and NGOs fighting AIDS and the world hunger. Um, the main aim of this presentation is to um, address some of the common web accessibility issues and to demonstrate the most time and cost efficient methods of resolving them. So at some point of this presentation, I would also like to show you the difference between the approach we had even two years ago and our current website accessibility practices. I'll also demonstrate some solutions that have been a point of reference and a source of inspiration for our work. We'll also go through a couple of the most popular WordPress sites to pinpoint good and bad practices. It is understandable that um, people may not want to go through various documentations, which um, though they provide an invaluable source of knowledge, might seem daunting for an, an average website owner. So this is why, rather than focusing on theory, my goal was to present the content in a practical way, focusing on real-life examples and explaining the reasons behind using certain solutions. So in the course of this presentation, I will be emphasizing the fact that web accessibility is not a one-time action or something that you can simply check or tick with a particular solution like a plugin, but rather a mindset, a one that needs to be adopted and constantly taken into consideration. It's kind of an investment, though not necessarily a financial one, 
that pays its dividends in equal opportunities for a larger group of people. As a result, this will translate into increased traffic and these people may potentially become, may have a chance to become your clients or customers. Not to mention the fact that we can avoid lawsuits, which used to be individual cases in the past, but are now becoming more and more popular, especially in the US. Another benefit of adopting accessibility standards on your website is that it simplifies the user experience and makes it easier and more pleasant to navigate the site. As an old school keyboard person myself, I'm particularly inclined to websites and web apps that allow me to navigate entirely using the keyboard. There are other benefits of following accessibility standards, such as higher ranking in search engines, but I will not be covering this in this presentation. Okay, so let me go to the takeaways. What to know before choosing an accessibility plugin? <clears throat> so plugins, since most features a WordPress site can offer are usually achieved by the use of certain commercial or non-commercial plugins, it's the very first thing that comes into mind of a site owner when thinking about implementing accessibility solutions. We will feature some of the most popular accessibility plugins and discuss the core acceptance criteria that they should meet. You will learn what to pay attention to in your choice of plugins and how to differentiate between good and bad ones. <clears throat> So what are differences between bad practices and accessibility-oriented solutions? Well, to give you a hands-on experience, we'll go through an example of a badly optimized page and see what we can do to fix the accessibility issues there. This is also the section where I'm going to show you a couple of good examples on some of the most popular WordPress sites. For legal reasons, for obvious reasons, I won't be showing you the bad examples on live sites, but unfortunately, it doesn't really take much to find them on the internet. Now, as to the tips and tricks on how to check your current website compliance with WCAG2. Um, a thing on general accessibility checkers. So there are various tools, both commercial and non-commercial ones, that allow us to check our score and assess the scale of accessibility issues and thus can help us plan and prioritize specific actions. Virtually all of these checkers will indicate which issues should be prioritized, as not all of the issues are of equal severity. Um, I'm, I'm sure that you're familiar with uh, the, the three compliance levels. Uh, we distinguish three compliance levels within the WCEG2. So this is the, the A, double A, and triple A, and they are minimal, acceptable, and optimal accessibility thresholds, respectively. So unsurprisingly, you should act on the most critical level A issues before addressing double A or triple A. There's a caveat, though. One needs to acknowledge that Depending on the website content or the, the layout or the design, it may not always be possible to achieve 90% and above score in the highest AAA level. Ways to improve accessibility on the website or by yourself. So when adopting accessibility best practices, one needs to remember that installing a plugin um, or hiring an agency to code some functionalities is not the ultimate solution. While there are some issues that obviously cannot be resolved without web development expertise and it could even potentially be dangerous if amended by the site owners themselves, there are certain steps that you can and should take by yourself to increase the accessibility for all users. So while you may not be able to globally change font sizes from pixels to rem values or to properly structure the HTML scaffolding, you probably know the content and the context of your website more than any developer. So your contribution should not be underestimated. At a later stage of this presentation, you will see that a web agency can actually give you accessibility optimized website foundations, but the rest is in your hands. So that's why it's so crucial to remain ever informed about the best practices and understand what accessibility, what this accessibility is all about. Um, now, accessibility in real life. We'll go through a case study. So in this part of the presentation, we're going to showcase a real live example of a website which has been transformed with accessibility in mind. Another digital agency, our business partner, reached out to us as they needed to improve the accessibility score measured by Site Improve on the client's website. The acceptable threshold was 85, as that is the industry standard for education. And at the time, the score was around 60. So, well, we rolled out the sleeves, did some research, and helped them with achieving a more than satisfactory score. Actually, the screenshots I will be sharing are showing a slightly lower score than the current one, um, as I was preparing the presentation before. So I will run a check on this site in real time to show you how much it has improved 
just within a couple of days. You'll see that it's possible to significantly improve accessibility score and avoid lawsuits without resorting to rebuilding the website entirely. So the pros and cons of accessibility plugins, what to check before choosing one. As to the pros and cons of plugins in general, these are usually the same regardless of the plugin's purpose. So the good thing about them is that they provide a quick and easy solution to one's problems. But unfortunately, they also come with the downsides like the reduced site performance and lack of flexibility. So this is the list of plugins, a couple of plugins that you can see in the WordPress repository. The first thought that arises when we want to improve accessibility without a lot of expense are plugins. And there are quite a few of them. So first of all, these are the questions that we need to ask before we want to utilize a plugin um, to implement some accessibility features. So the toolbar, how does it look? Mm, and is it keyboard navigable? Um, let me draw your attention to the toolbar as most of the plugins come with one. So how does it look and is it actually accessible? One needs to test this aspect of a plugin. We need to make sure that the plugin toolbars are properly visible, they have correct color contrast, and that they can be easily navigable using the keyboard. So if your plugin doesn't meet all of these requirements, it's better to find another one. And there's just plenty of them. So another thing, what are its functions? When we're testing a plugin, another question is, what are the toolbars functions? And are these features working correctly? Um, believe me or not, I've tested various plugins prior to this um, conference, to this presentation, and I must say that using some of them was a complete nightmare. So um, now the thing about customization, is it possible to customize the plugin features and can I extend its functionality? So regarding the customization, some of the plugins come with extra options that you can enable from the admin panel level. The plugin settings might give you an ability to increase the font size globally or change the styling of the toolbar itself, which is particularly useful if, let's say, the plugin toolbar is dark and your website theme um, is, is using dark colors as well, or vice versa. So um, another thing that you can do with um, customizable plugins is, for instance, you can adjust the skip to content button. Um, sometimes we have a situation where the ID of the main section um, on a page might be slightly different than usual. So it's nice to have an option to insert custom IDs so that the button, uh, that the skip to content button can link to it correctly. Okay, now we're going to, now we're going to change the, um, we're going to change the, the screen, thank you. <clears throat> so I'm using the sandbox environment here. Let's go to the, the admin panel. and plugins. I'm going to show you just two of these plugins. Accessible WP, Accessibility Toolbar. This one is kind of, uh, it's it's quite common, it's quite popular. Let's activate this plugin. And um, as you can see, there is this guy, Accessible WP, just appeared here. Let's go back to the home page, And we can notice that there is a, um, that there's a, a toolbar here in the upper left corner. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm only using the, the keyboard to navigate the site. Let me refresh. And I'm only using the keyboard and actually I'm clicking through the entire admin bar. So oh, I can log out, I can skip the content. This skip the content button is actually a native functionality of this environment. So it's not part of the plugin. Um, and logo, home page, bad example, empty items. I'm scrolling through the menu. I'm scrolling through um, the links, some of the items. Um, basically, I have to scroll through the entire site. I have to click through the entire site to get to this plugin um, navigation. So, um, well, that's a, that's a huge, a rather huge disadvantage of this plugin, um, but it has some nice it has some nice features uh, like um, keyboard navigation. I'm not entirely sure how effective it is, and I'm I'm not really confident that it's uh, that it's very useful 
um, as um, sometimes implementing keyboard navigation is not that straightforward. Um, you can also disable animations, uh, you can increase contrast, but actually, as you can see, the, the navigation here is, is kind of, um, it's kind of confusing because this should be on and actually it's off. So the visual indicator uh, shows that we are using a function and actually we are not using it. So, so this is kind of confusing. Decrease text, readable font, anything doesn't have any effect on the site. Um, mark titles, highlight links and buttons. This is cool. Okay. So, but in general, I would say that it's not the best plugin that I've ever had. And it's definitely not something that I would recommend because of the fact that it's not easily accessible. Okay. Let's deactivate the plugin. So I'm going to pages, plugins. Deactivate. And let's try another one. Another plugin is one click accessibility. Let's go to the home page. Um, there is a very subtle rectangle here in the upper left corner. So let me just refresh the site. I press tab once and I have the skip to content button, which is an actual functionality of this plugin. It's not the original skip to content button. And the other tab, so um, one more tab further, I'm in accessibility tool, so I can reach the toolbar quite easily. It's it's very useful. Um, so I can click through or scroll through, click through these um, these functionalities, increase text. I can do it um, repeatedly. I can decrease the text. Get back to your, to the um, original one. Grayscale. High contrast comes in handy. Negative contrast comes in handy. Light background, links underline, it's very important. As you can see, it makes a huge difference. This is a, um, a very important aspect of implementing um, accessibility on your website. Links, you should, you should never rely on the color differences between plain text and the links. So they should always have some additional indication that they are actual links and not just text. Readable font, okay, that's cool. And reset to reset all the features. So I would say that it's a, it's a really good plugin. It's um, it's a really nice solution. It's quite lightweight, very lean. Um, maybe the if I were really really I don't know, exigent, I would say that the that the button here, sorry, that the toolbar um, icon is too subtle for my taste. But still, within a reach of two clicks, uh, you can you can get into the um, accessibility tools. So that's really cool. That's a very useful plugin. And if you're looking for an easy way, um, a quick and free way to improve your website accessibility, you should definitely go for this one. Okay. Um, let me deactivate the plugin. Activate. All right, and let's get back to the um, to the slideshow. Thank you. So, a thing about good and bad practices, do's and don'ts of accessibility development. <clears throat> so, in this section, I'm going to show you a couple of truly evident accessibility errors. I've created a sandbox site where I will demonstrate bad practices and show some tips and tricks on how to fix them efficiently using just the Gutenberg editor. But I can't say that I've had a vast experience with um, heavyweight builders like Elementor um, and the like, but I'm pretty sure that they should provide similar options. So I'm quite confident that you will have basic functions like alternative text for images and so on. Okay. Um, so we need to go to, so, sorry, we need to go back to the, um, to the site. Thank you. 
So let me open the, the bad example here. Well, <clears throat> let's take a look at the hero image on this page. The text reads, have yourself a little coffee, you deserve it. But beside the fact that it's kind of cheesy and that the color contrast is here, here is simply outrageous, you may notice that nothing happens when I'm trying to grab this text. So I'm trying to select the text with the, the mouse cursor, but nothing happens. Mm, this is because it's a, the, the dreaded image of text, and it's a huge no-no for any respectable content editor. So it's definitely something that we should avoid. If we scroll down further a bit to the text section, you'll notice that there are no margins. So the letters adhere directly to the viewport and it's just a torture to read. It's important to add some margins and in WordPress, especially in, in Gutenberg Editor, you can do so by inserting the text into a container. Sometimes it's easily it's not easily noticeable but i think in in this case it's rather evident that the headings don't have a correct hierarchy so as you can see the first one here is a bit smaller sample heading this sample heading is a bit is a bit larger so the correct hierarchy is h1 to h6 without skipping any um, any heading levels in between it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use all of the heading levels on all of the pages that you have. But if we are using, let's say, H2 and H4, let's make sure that there is an H3 in between. Another good practice for the headings is that there should be only one H1 level heading for the page. So um, it's also important uh, from the, um, the reader's mode uh, standpoint and and it helps the screen readers to render the sites properly. Okay, let's scroll to this one. Well, another thing that should be amended here is the color contrast. So while these examples <clears throat> are flagrantly illegible, even for people with perfect vision, if you, even if you're a, I don't know, a marksman, there are some color, ch um, there are some color issues here. So there are some um, color combinations which might look okay at a first glance, but will be unreadable by people with various types of color blindness. So this is why a color contrast checker is an absolute must before we add any content to our website. Now for the uppercase text, well, um, not only that it's particularly annoying, in my opinion at least, but it all, it's also difficult to read. So I think we should definitely reduce it to an absolute bare minimum. So if we really have to use the, the uppercase text, let's make sure that we use it for emphasizing certain words, not for emphasizing an entire paragraph, just like we have it here. <clears throat> Another thing, if you if your copy contains URLs, like we have here, https um, colon slash 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 google.com, um, well, I can't really do anything with this URL as it's not a correct link. So make sure if your copy contains URLs, you need to make sure that they're not plain text. Uh, they need to be actual links so that they can be easily accessed. And the same thing goes for email addresses and the telephone numbers. So the email addresses, we need to make sure that they are using the um, mail to column prefix um, in the href value. And for the phone numbers, these should be using a tell colon prefix in the HR value as well. So usually the Gutenberg editor can help us with this as it should turn URLs and email addresses into actual links without any prompt. It just does it automatically. Um, but the phone numbers though, they're not rendered by default as links because also they have slightly different formatting because of the country codes and so on and so on. Um, so they are usually not rendered as links and they might need more, let's say, manual input from the from the editors. So even if we even if we amend the uh, the link here, okay, let's um let's get busy. Let's try to fix this page. So I'm going to edit page. 
can change some of these things. And so first of all, I would get rid of this um, of this image and replace it with with an actual image without any um, without any text. All right. So we have alternative text. We can insert some old text here, like um, a coffee maker and a cup of coffee. Um, <clears throat> what else? We can add um, text over the image. So this is what uh, Gutenberg editor um, allows us to do. Add text over the image. Um, let's say I want to make it a heading. Let's make it a heading one. And have yourself a little coffee. Okay. So I think we could get rid of the overlay. We don't need it. Sometimes it's useful, especially if we have tons of various colors in the image itself and we want to make sure that the um that the font that the text is readable <clears throat> then we can um then we can apply some some opacity filter on that but in this case i don't think i'm going to use it that much okay i'll just make sure that dimensions are all right okay the dimensions are all right and looks kind of good. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's definitely readable. And it's actual text, so, so that's cool. Um, yeah, align text left. Why not? Okay. So another thing that I would like to amend here would be um, the containers, or rather the lack of containers. It's um, it's easy to do it. I always use um, this list view, so it helps me with determining which um, parent and child element I'm using. Mm, okay, let's add a container here. Insert before container. And we can just Um, control, um, control, command. If you're using Mac, command shift the entire um, the entire text. So all of these blocks they are selected, and we can just do command X to cut them. And now we can insert them into the container. So as you can see, we have the container here. And inside this container, we have the heading, paragraph, um, and so on. So everything that we, everything that we need. Okay, this should be helpful. Just let me check if we have. Let's see if we have the margins now. It's always good to check what it looks like on the front end. Yep, so we have, oh, we're missing the heading here. That doesn't, um, it's not relevant at the moment, but we are definitely, um, we've made some improvement as we can see that we have, uh, we have the margins now. So it's easy to read, but of course, what is not easy to read here is the color contrast. So let's make sure that we're using the right color contrast. Let's go make it black. Let's make this a H2. And let's make it black as well. So what is it? It's an H2 as well. Okay, let's make it H3. No, it's not it's not black. Okay, let's get back here and make sure that it's black. It should be black now. <coughs> So H6, H3 here, H6 here. Well, that's a, that's a huge leap. So let's make it an H4. Mm, let's change the text color here. And 
let's make sure it's not uppercase. Let's switch the default. And so now it's a, a regular text, normal text. And let's make sure that this HTTPS tool.com is an actual link. I'm just going to click link and automatically it, um, it becomes a link without uh, manually inserting the, the URL. It's, it's quite intelligent. Okay, let's do the same for the email address. And as you can see, Gutenberg Editor automatically added mail to support at mailbox.com. Um, I don't think it's going to be that easy with the phone number, but let's give it a try. So yeah, that's what I thought. It's not that easy. So let me just copy it with Command C and link. We like tell. This is going to be an actual telephone link. Okay, sample heading. Well, H3. We don't want an H3 here. Let's make it an H4, for instance. Heading H6, I think we're lacking H5, so let's make it H5. And same thing about the email here. All right. Now it looks much better. Well, we still have this guy here. Let's just make sure that we're using an actual image and, and text instead of an image of text. So I'm going to change this uh, image. Okay. If we really didn't need it, we don't have to put the um, the text on the on the image. So, okay, this should look much better now. Right, get up here. So this was how we were able to. <clears throat> okay, sorry, the sample heading, it got out of the container. Let me quick, uh, quickly fix it. Let's put it into the container. Okay, we got here, and let's make it H2. Okay, cool. All right. So, in just a in just a couple of steps, we were able to um, to improve the accessibility of the site. So this is what it looks like now. Okay. Um, let me get back to the slideshow. And let's discuss a couple of action items. So, what can I do to fix it? What can I do to fix the accessibility issues? First of all, you can add um, alternative text to images. This is really important. Um, when we're adding alternative text, it's important not to duplicate the um, the actual text, the actual copy, right? So let's say that we have, um, I don't know, John Doe, and we have a picture of John Doe. Let's make sure not to, um, to use uh, John Doe as the alt text, because the actual text will also say, John Doe. So we have John Doe, John Doe, uh, read by the screen readers. And that's kind of uh, kind of confusing. Um, okay, we we should make sure that we add descriptions and subtitles to each video. And actually you can do so with uh, 
with help of most of the, um, the video tools like YouTube, Vimeo, and so on. So um, they all offer, all these services offer um, offer this functionality. <clears throat> Make sure that the audio files are subtitles. Um, this one is pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's uh, pretty much the same as, uh, as with the videos. And check the structure of the heading. So this is what, we, what we've just done. We've made sure that we have um, H1 coming from H1 to H6 or to H4, but we're not skipping any of the heading levels. All right. Uh, what else can you do uh, by yourself? Choose a font size that is easy to read, right? So we want to make sure that uh, the font size that we have is easy to read. Refrain from inserting images as links. Um, it's it can also be confusing for the uh, for people who are using screen readers, and make sure you're not using an illegible font family. That's a, that's a rather important one. So uh, if you go to any of the site checkers like Site Improve, you can um, you can actually uh, you can check what what font families are recommended and what font families are not recommended. Um, and take care of the color contrast. So as I said previously, the color contrast checkers are an absolute must whenever we insert, whenever we add new content to our website. All right. Um, okay. So a thing on the accessibility checkers. <clears throat> Before we jump into this subject, just a short caveat. From my experience, uh, if your goal is to make sure that your website is uh, only compliant with the standards to avoid lawsuits, you'll probably be fine with using just one of them. Having said that, if you really want to improve the website accessibility, mm, it makes more sense to compare the results of at least two of these tools, as they will be slightly different. <clears throat> so one tool might pinpoint a specific error, and another one might just completely ignore it. So uh, the first one that comes into mind, okay, we have the list here. Okay, so we have a list of a couple of um, accessibility checkers. We have Site Improve, IBM Equal Access Toolkit, Wave, and Quality Logic. So um, um, Site Improve. It's an excellent tool which provides very detailed insights. I've used it on a couple of occasions and I can't recommend it highly enough. But one needs to keep in mind that it's a commercial service. So if you'd rather have your website checked for free, there are some alternatives to that. Um, Lighthouse Accessibility Checker comes um, in a bundle with Google PageSpeed Insights. So it will show you the most critical errors, but it's overall quite lenient compared to other accessibility checkers. So I personally never use it as a point of reference for improving website accessibility. But it's nice to know that, that you can also use it. Another thing, uh, another one on the list is coming from webaccessibility.com, and its main functionality is just a basic score check. But it's uh, it also has um, they provide some commercial browse extensions, and interestingly, they have tools that can help you uh, with uh, software development lifecycle. So you can integrate them into your uh, workflow if you're using tools for testing automation like Selenium or Cypress. Mm, this is something definitely worth developers' attention. Another thing that comes into mind in regard to the free alternatives is the accessibilitychecker.org, which provides a rather detailed report on the exact elements. Um, and the, the cool thing is that you can actually choose which standards you'd like to follow, depending on your location. So this is particularly useful if your goal is to make sure that your website is observing legal regulations in a specific country. My personal favorite is Wave by WebAIM. I'm not even sure if there's a commercial option of this tool, because the free version provides so much insight that I've never really given it a thought. You can generate a detailed live report, which allows you to interact with it in real time. You can switch to other pages. It pinpoints all errors, warnings, area attributes, and so on and so on. So I'm just being conscious of time. We are running out of time a bit. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these uh, accessibility checkers. But let's just quickly discuss the benefits of, of these. So they clearly show you what needs to be fixed, at least some, if not most of them, they show you what needs to be fixed. Um, they usually show you the priority. Sorry, my series on. Okay. Um, 
All right. Uh, they also provide suggestions on how to fix it. So, um, well, whenever you have an issue, you can you can expand the issue. They have some drop downs, um, and they can point you directly to the um, W3 uh, reference where you can see the documentation and you can just you can just check what exactly needs to be fixed and they also um, help you with understanding why certain things are considered as errors so it's also nice to have in you know in terms of uh, educating yourself and um, staying ever informed and uh, well that goes without saying they are compatible with the latest WCAG requirements Okay, and sometimes using accessibility checkers, um, like running a full uh, website check would be an overkill. If we want to check um, a certain color combination, we can just opt for an, um, a contrast checker uh, like uh, the WebAIM um, contrast checker or site improved contrast checker. I think we have, yeah, we have the site improved one here. So as you can see, if the ratio is below three, uh, three to one, all of the tests will be failed. So we have the ratio here, uh, 2.13 to one, and we are just failing all of the um, um, all of the standards, right? We're not we are not meeting any of the standards. <clears throat> In this case, the ratio is 5.63 to one, and actually, as you can see, we are almost we're meeting almost all of the um, of the standards, so we have um, double A for normal text. We are not meeting the triple A for normal text. We're meeting double A for large text, uh, triple A for large text, and double A for graphics. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I'm just being conscious of time, so let me uh, let me proceed to the case study. So, um, <clears throat> one of the universities in the U.S. reached out to our clients, uh, our agency clients, as they needed help. Um, with making their website compliant with WCAG2. They emphasized that the score needed to be 85 points or above to make sure that the website was fully accessible and to avoid legal actions be taken against them. So this is a chart. Let me show you the chart. Okay. This is a chart um, of the, the score history, the score and the, the issue history. So when we started our work, the overall score was 66. And there were several critical A-level issues on the site, which, as you can imagine, made it virtually impossible to be read with assistive technologies. So I'm just going to quickly list some of the issues that, um, that uh, we had. So some of the pages didn't have any titles or they were extremely long. And actually, the, um, the page titles uh, are quite easily uh, resolved with the WordPress, basically to, to set the, um, the main website title uh, you just go to the the general settings and and you and you have the respective field for that and the same thing with uh, with individual pages the very first heading of um, of a page at least in Gutenberg editor so the very first heading of a page is an actual um, HTML title um, also there are no area labels used and uh, well that makes it very difficult if 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 not impossible at all uh, to navigate the website uh, using assistive technologies and many images um were lacking alt text so that's also a big um a big no no and the color contrast needed to be improved so there were some there were some places where we had um very low contrast and it was just difficult um it was barely readable Okay, when we finished working on the site, the score was 87. And then came the new content, which introduced some minor issues and reduced the score to 84. And this was a very valuable lesson for us, as it proved it's crucial to stay ever informed about best practices. So our reaction was, well, first of all, to make some revisions and to fix the issues, and then to educate the client on how to keep the score high. So at the moment, the site improved score is slightly above 90, and the um, a and double A level issues have been reduced to the bare minimum. Because of the design layout and also some complex features, it wasn't possible to, you know, to squeeze the 
um, the maximum of it and to entirely get rid of uh, AAA level issues. But this story clearly shows that with the right tools and attitude, you can transform an average site into a perfectly accessible and optimized website. All right. Uh, thank you, Mike. This has been great. We have a couple of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. This one came in twice. Uh, does the grouping in containers have an effect on an accessibility or the behavior of screen readers? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, I think it's uh, it's important to um, to keep the right the right structure. So, if let's say the sorry, how do you mean how do you mean grouping? Um, I think when you were looking at the, let me see if I can, if there was any additional information. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's all I have. Just repeated twice. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. So yeah, if, if the, the person asking the question could elaborate on this, I'll, I'll be more than happy to, to answer to this question. Um, but generally saying, um, well, the more complex it is, uh, so the more complex the um, the container structure is, the more difficult it is for um, for the editors to keep it accessible, right? So we should definitely, I think, the simplicity is the key here. So if we can do something in an easy way, in a, in a simple, straightforward way, let's just opt for it. Okay. Um, and then another question about plugins. Uh, are some plugins better for scale? So do some work better for smaller sites uh, and one or two operators, or maybe some work better for large sites with multiple oper operators? Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, um, how do you mean operators? Again, I'm just reading as it's oh, okay, uh, okay. I understand. <laughs> um, yes, I think. Well, with with the plugins, I think if if they are simple and they are accessible, um, then there is really no um, say no reason to. <clears throat> okay. Oh, okay. So just okay, some okay. Clarification. operators yeah. as users. Okay, there we go. Operators as users. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, from the, also from the site performance perspective, it's better to keep the plugins as simple as possible, right? So um, if you're using, let's say, um, a heavyweight plugin, which might be useful for uh, implementing some of the features on, on your website, if it's a complex one, um, you need to take into account the fact that it's it's going to affect the site performance. So. Um, so it's also something that we need to keep in mind, right? Right, and then we have a couple questions about the accessibility checkers. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is just, uh, are there some checkers that are better for bigger websites versus smaller? Mm. Well, I, I would say that there are, um, yes, that's, that's a good question. I would say that there are, um, basically, if you are using um the the free checkers you are just um running a check against a single url usually right so um so it just takes more let's say manual input to uh, to use uh to enter all the urls and make sure that all the pages uh, that you're interested in that all the pages are accessible right uh, whereas if you if you use commercial services um <clears throat> which most of these plugins really uh, really offer. If you use commercial services, um, well, you, you basically have better support. You have a, a full site audit, so you actually have people who are doing the who are running the check for you. So it's um, it's a matter of compromise between doing a lot of manual work versus um, paying some money for the uh, for the check, right? Um, and then there was a comment uh, referring to the accessibility uh, checkers that you mentioned, um, and they're saying, given that only about 30% of accessibility issues are testable by automation, how do you claim that uh, a yeah. test with the checker can allow you to reach that WCAG compliance? I, I totally agree with that. Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, well, these, we need to... We need to realize that there are certain limitations to these checkers, right? They are not 
as much as the, the developers of these checkers may try, they're not intelligent at all. So um, we <laughs> we should always rely um, rely on someone who has more, you know, someone who has expertise. We should uh, we should refer to the documentation. There are tons of you know there are tons of educational materials that you can read on the internet, and I think that they provide much much more insight than um done just you know running uh, running a check on the website and 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 then you think that you're done uh, that's completely not true so um i think that that's the most that's the most important factor here the the human contribution right um it's it's absolutely it's absolutely essential so um i personally know a lot of sites i've i've been doing a lot of research on on some of the most popular sites and i know a lot of sites which have tremendous scores which have really great scores like above 90 uh, on most of the accessibility checkers but they have basic uh, really really basic issues with uh, keyboard navigation so we shouldn't only rely on the checkers themselves and we shouldn't treat them as an absolute uh, source of truth and uh, a, po uh, a point of reference so it's a nice addition uh, and it's useful, I would say it's useful primarily if your goal is to, you know, to avoid lawsuits, just to, to get a certificate to, uh, to make, well, to show, to demonstrate that your website is compliant, right? But there is a huge difference between compliance and accessibility itself. So I also know sites which are super accessible, which have tons of functionalities, all the area labels, descriptions, uh, keyboard navigation, and so on and so on. And at the same time, they have score like, you know, 70 which is kind of okay, but nothing spectacular, right? So, um, yes, I think I think it's super important. All right. Well, we are out of time, um, but if you have an answer to this question in 20 seconds, uh, do you recommend a particular plug-in for e-commerce sites? Uh, um, it would depend. <laughs> if you mean WooCommerce, then I would say that the plugin that I was showcasing would be okay, right? But... Uh, Shopify, you know, there are tons of different platforms of e-commerce platforms. So, so um, there is no no one uh, straight answer to that. Sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. All right. Well, thank you for the session, and thank, thank you, you and thank you everyone for attending uh, the session with Mike Zemak. Uh, you can continue this conversation in the chat or on social media using the hashtag WPA. 11Y day and uh, hashtag WP2022. Uh, we appreciate it if you do go to wpaccessibility.day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentation. Um, I believe there's also a way for you to enter in for a free t-shirt. Um, please stay tuned for our lightning talks round two uh, coming up next with Robert Jacoby, Nick Croft, and Katie Gleason. That will be at 5 p.m. Uh, and while you're waiting, please don't forget to visit our sponsors pages to grab some virtual swag and enter for a chance to win some great prizes. So thank you and we'll see you right here after the break.
Hello everyone, welcome to WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Jay McKay and I'm the Director of Community Programs at Nobility. Uh, this session is going to be a lightning round of three short talks that have been pre-recorded. Uh, our first talk will be, Can the Cloud Accelerate Accessibility? Uh, presented by Robert Jacoby, who's Director of WordPress Cloudways. The second talk will be ARIA State Management and Modern CSS, presented by Nick Croft, lead developer at Reactive Studios. And the third session will be Introducing Accessibility to Existing Designs, presented by Katie Gleason, web designer at WP Engine. Um, for this session, there will not be a Q&A during the lightning round, but please feel free to use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. Hello everyone. I'm Robert Jacoby, Director of WordPress at Cloudways, and it's my great pleasure to talk about whether the cloud can accelerate accessibility Let's jump right into it. What cloud are we talking about? I like to look at the cloud in a couple of different ways. There are some of the more traditional understandings of what the cloud is, and then a couple of other different parts and pieces. I like to think about it first and foremost from a hosting perspective. Why? Because everything is hosted somewhere. No matter what kind of application, whether it's on, you know, AWS, on DigitalOcean, on Cloudways, or self-hosted, some other kind of uh, virtual private server, everything's hosted somewhere. Hosting is the critical component of everything that's online. I know it's probably pretty self-explanatory and obvious, but this means that, that folks who are in hosting have a critical role in how quickly accessibility is adopted. My next cloud is the cloud of interaction, social media, tons of user generated content. This is the place where folks come in and out to drop in videos, images, text, audio, everything. You know, of course, we're talking about Instagram, Twitter, uh, you know, Pinterest, you know, what, whatever is out there <laughs> that can really uh, be considered social. It's hugely important. So much information is going back and forth. So we have our hosting cloud, sort of our social media cloud, and then the software as a service cloud, every other application online. And we use these things all the time. Everything from our banks, you know, QuickBooks, uh, Adobe's creative cloud, uh, all, all kinds of applications, you know, Microsoft 365, uh, Google Workspace, you know, that's that software as a service cloud. So it, it tries to cover all those sort of more niche uh, applications that, you know, I wouldn't say are typically hosting or uh, social media. Our next question is, does the cloud actually understand accessibility? What do I mean by that? Have they done some of that homework that's even necessary to really uh, ramp up and accelerate accessibility for everyone? Let's take a look at a couple of quick uh, items. Is that cloud provider, whether it's a hosting company, social media company, some other so uh, uh, software as a service, is their site accessible? You know, are, are they doing some of the legwork to uh, implement accessibility, you know, on their own? And that's usually a first step for a, a lot of projects in development. You're going to try things out on your own and see what best practices are. So one way to see whether that cloud provider is, is looking uh, to the future around uh, being, uh, taking accessibility seriously is whether their site is actually accessible. Do they have an accessibility team? Now this is critical for small to medium to large size businesses. 
Uh, and you know, a lot of times that team can be outsourced, of course. I recommend having human participants on that accessibility team. A lot of the software solutions uh, are, I find today, still much riskier than having folks who are completely uh, embedded and understand what the necessary requirements for accessibility are. So are there accessibility experts on staff? Again, we're looking at you know, where cloud providers, again, hosting, social media, SaaS, are, you know, wh whether they're, you know, on the road to being successful on accessibility to see how quickly they will uh, support some of the ideas I have for accessibility in the future. So other accessibility experts on staff. And then sort of almost at the furthest level, is there actual accessible support for customers? Is this some kind of uh, chat bot that you know really doesn't work with all sorts of accessible applications? Is, you know, is, it, is it completely incompatible with screen readers? Uh, are, are, is there an understanding on support teams that they may be interacting with someone who has accessible requirements? So you know, understanding, again, where on the spectrum a cloud provider might be, I think is critical because the cloud can help a lot. Where could the cloud help? In literally everything. And it, it's interesting how, especially, it can benefit uh, WordPress developers, agencies, uh, and even end users. The cloud can help, first and foremost, by enforcing front end accessibility. I mentioned user created content earlier because I think. That, that it's a almost a quick and dirty way to uh, st start dropping in some type of accessibility that uh, is clear, easy, un understood well. My favorite example is if you are going to upload an image, that image can't be uploaded without proper tagging, period. Cl the cloud can enforce this. I mean, it's so easy for, you know, all these applications uh, that, you know, tie into your camera to just be like, oh, just upload away, upload away. But the cloud can enforce front end accessibility by saying, thanks for your image. We can't publish this until you fill out accessible content. That move in itself would greatly uh, benefit the internet for accessibility requirements. We can do that with all sorts of content, obviously. So if we're looking at, you know, I mentioned images because I think that's probably one of the easiest enforceability aspects on the front end. Uh, but also, obviously, video, audio, uh, going through some of that le legwork. Maybe even offering it as a type of upsell uh, to make sure that it's done right. Uh, I, I mentioned I'm not a big fan of automated solutions, but they're sometimes better than nothing, right? So, so again, having a level of front end accessibility enforcement, I think is critical to the success, success of the internet, as well as something that can dramatically accelerate the adoption of good accessibility uh, on the internet by these cloud providers. <clears throat> and that's right, hosting companies can make that a requirement. And it's you know, really education for both developers and end users that this is going to be part of the process. Uh, you know, we, we don't allow uh, bad tagging anymore uh, in HTML for that same reason. And that's going to take me to the next uh, bit of the conversation is enforcing infrastructure accessibility, render with standards. So everything should be uh, uh, you know, run through at least some kind of uh, code checker and enforcing that on the back end is, is really important. That, that improves the quality of code, obviously, and makes that code also accessible to folks who want to update it. So if we think about that in the open source space, but can, uh, from sort of a bottom up, start percolating to what uh, on the earlier slide talking about 
enforcing front end standards, you know, going one step, one step, one step at a time. Tied very closely to infrastructure, of course, is third party accessibility. The cloud can enforce third party accessibility. Don't accept plugins, JavaScripts, and APIs that haven't been thoroughly vetted. The cloud can make sure that happens, either as a provider of those services or as a you know, recipient and user of those services. We don't need WordPress plugins that aren't accessible. We don't need bad JavaScript that screws up page rendering. We don't need APIs that don't spit out uh, data that isn't uh, accessi accessibly tagged, that, that isn't ready uh, to be uh, repurposed in an accessible standard. So many times we're getting content, images, media uh, directly from the API, and that's all we're getting. We're not getting all the metadata around that that could actually be utilized to uh, create a much more accessible experience for folks. And really, accessibility improves the web all around. If you think about the enforcement of front end, back end, and third party uh, you know, integrations, that enforcement would dramatically accelerate the web. web. You look at all the opportunities that would be created. You know, even simple things for, for folks who don't need accessibility, they don't realize how sometimes they may be, may be situations where if they were working from an accessible site, their experience would be dramatically improved. Maybe it's on a mobile phone in a bright day and the contrast is actually uh, good enough is made improved, I should say, by an accessible website rather than on a site that's all cluttered and garbagey and then you still can't utilize the experience. Obviously, good tagging for everything improves search engine optimizations. Uh, it, it, it clarifies content. It helps uh, create taxonomies of data. So it, it's, it's, it's very exciting for me, the opportunities that exist, uh, that exist for the cloud to really accelerate uh, adoption of accessibility through enforcement, front end, back end, and third party. I hope that we can all uh, start poking, prodding, and really demanding at the end of the day that those types of standards are, are ones that should be the you know commonplace across the internet, not an exception to the rule. We don't we don't need bad SaaS, bad hosting, bad social. Uh, from an accessibility perspective. It, it only it hinders communication. And at the end of the day, I find that accessibility improvements are really communication improvements. So thank you very much. Uh, Robert Jacoby from Cloudways. You can reach me at my email, robert at cloudways.com, on Twitter, at Robert Jacoby, and on my phone number. Yep, I actually put that in there. That's 847-687-5860, US. Can't guarantee I'll answer everyone's texts. <laughs> Thank you very much and have a great WordPress Accessibility Day. All right, we're gonna transition to our second talk, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, Robert Jacoby is with us uh, hanging out in the chat. So please feel free to pop in your questions. I'm sure he would love to interact with you all. Uh, our second talk is going to be ARIA State Management and Modern CSS uh, presented by Nick Croft, lead developer of Reactiv Studios. Folks, this is uh, Nick Croft with Reactive Studios. You may already know me as Nick the Geek. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about ARIA state management and modern CSS. Before I get into that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, visually, I am a pretty large guy. I've got shaggy hair and a shaggy beard. I'm wearing a blue shirt. Uh, it may look kind of scary, but I promise I'm really nice. Uh, one thing about me is I just recently got my first tattoo. Uh, that is in honor of my daughter. 
Uh, last year, she had a traumatic heart attack, nearly died on us, uh, lost her left leg, has a brain injury, but she's doing phenomenally well. Uh, she's been recovering, started back at school. We're really excited about that. So I got that on her alive day to honor the fact that she survived. Um, I bring that up because a lot of uh, what I focus on is accessibility. I've been focused on that for a long time, but now it's like lit the fire, so to speak. I, I'm even more excited about it. Um, so I want to dig in and talk about what's going on with ARIA state management. I've created a demo here. You should be able to see it. I've got uh, my accordion demo, and this accordion demo will use ARIA attributes to set state and controls, then style the states in order to make the make them the priority in the visual and screen reader information. So if I scroll down here, we'll see this uh, demo here. We've got toggle panel one with some lore MIPS in there. And uh, the first little bit of that is a link. And then toggle panel two and toggle panel three. Now, if I click on one of these, it's going to close. And if I click on it again, it's going to open. If I click on panel two, it's going to open. And if I click on panel three, it's going to open. And they will continue to toggle and open uh, as long as I continue to click on them. Now I can also use my uh, keyboard. So I'm switching to use the tab key. Uh, I am focused into panel one and I'm gonna hit the space bar and it opens right up. Now, if I tab again, it's gonna focus onto that lorem ipsum because it is a focusable element. I'm gonna tab out and close. If I tab again, it's gonna skip right over that. And that's really important that it doesn't focus on focusable elements when they've been hidden. So now uh, if I continue to tab around and open things up, it works. If I tab, tab up to panel number two, and this time I want to hit my enter key, it's going to work. Uh, and it's really important that that happens because buttons should work with the space bar and enter key. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. So the last thing I want to show you with this demo is uh, if I turn on my screen reader, it is going to work. Voice over on Safari. A one one way day demo. Private browsing window. Visited link. Word accordion. In. You are currently on a heading level two. So I am uh, using my screen reader. I've just used my mouse to, mouse to kind of move it into this so I can focus on the accordion demo. First thing I'm going to do is hit my tab key, which is going to move me down to the uh, panels. Toggle panel one, collapsed button. You and, are currently on a heading level three. And what it did was announce that this is currently collapsed. I'm going to use my space bar to open it. Toggle panel one, expanded button. And so now it's announced that it's expanded and I can go ahead and move in and see what's in that content. One. Link. Lorem. Fringillanis. I get dictum. Vellum. Solicitude. Iaculus. You are currently on a text element. Now I'm on toggle panel number two. And again, I can open this. Toggle panel two. Expanded button. Or I can close. toggle panel two. Collapsed button. Toggle panel three. Expanded button. Main. You are current. Toggle panel three. Collapsed button. Okay. Voice over off. So all the states are announced as we're working with this. And it's really important those states are announced so that people know what's happening, what's going to go on when they interact with all these buttons. Now let's look at some of the code that makes this work. Now you may be worried because it says svelte here. Uh, but I assure you the reason I picked this is so that we can focus on pure HTML. Uh, in fact, there is only HTML happening inside of this particular file. In the other files that we'll look at is only vanilla JavaScript and only simple CSS. Um, so the first thing we've got is a div, and we have an ID there. I'm not really using this right now, but I could use it if I needed it. Uh, and it has a class accordion. Most of the classes throughout here are used for styling. Uh, we do have a little bit of work that I'm using in JavaScript to pull in some of these classes. But for the most part, they're used for styling. Now we've got that H3, and we're using heading tag so that these can be part of headings as they appear above sections. Uh, so that is a little bit different than what we might have with different kind of uh, control, like a, a tab group, where it's not really separate sections that are there. Um, so this is going to be labeled using headings. And then we have a button. Uh, again, it's really important that we use a button. We'll talk about this some more later, but we get some free stuff because it's a button. Um, and the type is being declared. That's not necessarily specifically required. Uh, I pulled this from the WCAG um, ARIA uh, guidelines there as they, they had these different components. And I've modified it some, 
but I left in a few of the things that they had there. The aria expanded is what indicates that the panel is open. And then the class is what we're using to style it and then target it. And then we have aria controls and panel one. This is an ID and it targets this ID here that is our panel. So we're gonna link these two ideas together, these two elements together using this aria controls. And then finally, we have an ID on here uh, that we're gonna use as well to link these two things together. And so now we have a span and we have a little bit of text and that's being read out. We're using the span to handle some of our styling with this. Now we've got the panel itself. And so it has ID is panel one. The role is region because we've got multiple regions, we are labeling them. And so we label them using the accordion one which is our button. And so it's labeled by this content here. Next, we have a class. The class is being used in order to target this with CSS. And finally, we have aria hidden is false. Uh, this particular element is shown at page load, so it's not hidden. And our button says that it is expanded because the thing that it controls is not hidden, it's expanded. Inside of it, we just have a little bit of HTML, a couple of paragraph tags with some lower Mipson and this link tag. Uh, we can put any kind of HTML inside there that is access acceptable to put inside of a div, which is pretty much any kind of HTML. So you can have images, lists, headings. Um, you can have other divs, spans, um, tables, forms, whatever you need to put inside of there, it can be added to it. I basically replicated this two more times. So we have another H3 and button. Uh, this one is aria expanded false, and it is controlling this section, section two here, uh, which is aria hidden is true at page load. And this second, this third one rather is very similar, just has another unique ID here and a unique ID here. Uh, we want to make sure that these IDs are always unique so that they pull in and work correctly with our JavaScript. So speaking of our JavaScript, let's look at our JavaScript. Uh, it's all of 33 lines of code, including white space, including all of the comments that I've added to this to make it uh, understandable what's going on with everything. The first thing that I do, uh, well, I'm using a, a event listener on Don Loaded just to make sure that everything exists uh, before we start trying to interact with it. Um, the next thing I do is set my accordion triggers. I am targeting that class that is the buttons. Um, down at the bottom of there, I'm looping my accordion triggers and I'm adding an event listener on click. Now, this is why it's so important to use a button whenever you need to have some kind of actionable action, something that happens whenever you click on it instead of going to a different web page. Uh, because a button should respond to a click, it should respond to the enter key, it should respond to the space bar. If you used, an, uh, let's say, a link and gave it role equals button, then it would by default work with the enter key and work with a click, but it would not work with the space bar. So screen reader users are hearing this is a button, but they're not actually able to interact with it like a button. So then you have to add an event listener for key up to see if they press the space bar, which adds a lot more complexity. If you make it a button, you get all of that for free. Now this calls this button click, which just basically calls this toggle panel. The main reason I separated that out is I wanted to really be able to focus on what's happening here. So we have the button that gets passed to it and we load our panel. We're able to find our panel because we're using ARIA controls. Remember that is an ID and it is the ID of our panel. So we can just get this attribute and use get element by ID, and now we've got a panel. Uh, the next thing I want to do is find out if it's currently visible. And if it is visible, then aria expanded will be true. And so that's the current state of the button. Now we need to change the state of the button, which is what we're going to do here. So on the button itself, we are going to change the aria expanded to the opposite of whatever this visible property is. So if it's currently visible, it will now be false, aria expanded equals false. If it is not visible, so currently aria expanded is false, it's going to flip that to aria expanded is true. And then our panel property is going to also set an attribute on aria hidden. So if the 
is current if the button is currently visible aria expanded is true then that means aria hidden is currently false and we need to make aria hidden true so we're going to flip that now so it's going to become true or we're going to switch it around and make it false um, that's all of this of the javascript and all we're doing is flipping those two attributes and we're using the aria controls and the aria expanded to find out what current states are uh, we could do a lot of other stuff with state management if we wanted to, but this was really simple and really easy to do and lets the DOM be our state management. The last thing we have is our styling. Now with the styling, basically the top of this is focused largely on creating the look and feel of everything. Um, we're adding borders, we're adding some different spacing and padding. Um, some uh, colors, all of that stuff is happening. Now, one of the things that we have down here is on the accordion trigger after, this code right here is what is making our down arrow. And we are setting a transition of transform so that whenever this value changes, the transform is going to be animated. Um, and then again, with our accordion panel, we have set our visibility and we have hidden our overflow uh, and we have our scale set as a default. But the other thing that we're doing here is we have transition all. So we're gonna be actually animating a few different things whenever that expands. Now, the last bit, the stuff that actually does the triggering is this little code right here. So on our accordion trigger, whenever ARIA expanded is true, that means that it's open. We change our transform and what that does is flips the icon around so it's pointing up and it's going to do a rotate effect whenever that happens because we've got that transition on transform. And then the accordion panel itself if it is aria hidden true then we want to show uh, or we want to hide the accordion panel so by default it shows and then whenever the state changes we are going to hide it and so visibility becomes hidden this is really important because it's what prevents focus from happening uh, to content inside of there and then we change our scale and we change some padding and we change our height and that's what allows it to have that animate effect However, we don't want to leave that as the only way we do things because sometimes animations can cause people trouble. And so we have prefers reduced motion happening. And all I'm doing is taking those two animated elements and setting the transition to none. So it's going to just snap whenever people activate it. And that way they won't have any potentially triggering animations. Um, there's a lot of different ways to handle the animations. If I were to take a little bit more time, I'd probably work with some keyframes and get some roll-up effects or some other really cool things that you can do using keyframes. Uh, in that case, we would want to have a keyframe here that had either reduced motion or no motion associated with it. Um, that way we can honor that request for prefers reduced motion. So that's kind of all the stuff that's happening with this. Um, Everything is working really well. As you see, if I click on this, that rotates around, this animates down, all things are happening and working correctly. One of the things that I did is also uh, have a tabs demo. I don't have quite enough time to go through all the code, but it's really similar. And you just click on it, everything works correctly. All the ARIA controls, all of the uh, different ARIA described by labels all work correctly. The fun thing about this one is if you use your tab key, you actually focus on the tab group and then you're able to use your keyboard left, right arrows to navigate through all of this. Uh, otherwise, it works pretty much the same. Now, to make this easier for you to get, because I know there's a little bit of code there, uh, I've got these code pins set up. And so these links will make sure they're provided to you. And I'll be tweeting them out as well if you want to follow me at uh, Nick underscore the geek, just like it is here in this code pin. Um, but if you go to codepin.io, Nick underscore the geek pin, G zero, uh, G O Z Q K W L or uh, Y Z L B V M N, those two pins right there uh, are going to get you all of the code that I just shared. 
and it's going to be set up as pure HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, so you can import that into whatever kind of framework you're using, whether it's PHP, whether it's React, whether it's Vue, whether it's Svelte, whether it's whatever, you can get that into whatever you're using and start modifying this to your own ends. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Uh, looking forward to a great talk. You all have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you, Nick Croft. He is with us in the chat. So again, for these lightning rounds, we are not doing our typical Q&A. So if you have questions or ideas, please put them in the ideas tab. Uh, for our third session is going to be introducing accessibility to existing designs uh, presented by Katie Gleason, web designer at WP Engine. Hello, thank you for joining me. My name is Katie Gleason, and I am going to be um, talking to you all today about how to introduce accessibility to an existing design team, how we did it at WP Engine, and giving you some tips on how you can do it uh, with your own teams as well. So like I said before, um, my name is Katie. Um, I have short blonde hair, I wear glasses, they have green frames, but the frames are really thin, can't really see them. Um, I'm currently wearing a tan short sleeve button down shirt, and I have a sleeve of tattoos on my right hand, which you might see as I use my hands to talk a lot. So let's get into it. I'm a web designer with the storefront marketing team at WP Engine. Um, I came into design by way of psychology degree. Um, and I've been with WP Engine for a couple years now. Um, at about this point last year, actually, my team identified accessibility as an internal priority and took steps to, um, to head up this accessibility initiative um, within our storefront site design. And uh, I led that project. So I'm going to give you a little info on what we did and hopefully give you some tips on uh, what you can do as well. So the first thing we identified when we were talking about accessibility was that, you know, the storefront marketing team already had an existing design system that was being used for ads, was being used for the site, um, and had approval that went way over just our team. So, you know, while that design system wasn't made with accessibility in mind, we realized that, you know, we would have much more luck trying to um, find accessible solutions within that system than trying to change the system entirely. Um, that did add a layer of difficulty though. Um, the second thing we identified, our second hurdle, was that um, our team and me specifically, um, I really lacked the knowledge to identify and solve accessibility problems and issues that um, existed on our site. Um, I had always had a passion about accessibility, but I had never had any certifications, any training, and, you know, I didn't really know where to start. Um, and then our third big hurdle was that accessibility itself is um, a lot more complicated than this black and white view of checking boxes off of a list. Um, you know, while there is uh, a standard of, you know, various qualifications, um, sites and designs have to meet to be accessible. Um, accessibility is about a lot more than that. And I wanted um, our accessibility initiative to be stronger than just checking boxes. So the first hurdle that I tackled was education. Um, and with the support of my team, um, I was able to find a comprehensive introductory course um, called Introduction to Web Accessibility um, with W3CX. Um, and really educate myself on 
the why of accessibility as well as the what. Um, so who are we designing for? Why is it important that we make these things accessible? Um, for this initial accessibility push, you know, you do not have to become an expert in accessibility. That's not going to happen overnight. It's certainly not going to happen in two, four, six weeks. Um, you know, this initial education is the very beginning of what I consider to be a lifelong learning process. I'm about a year in and I'm still learning new things every day. Um, and I plan on learning new things every day for the rest of the time that I uh, do accessible design, um, which hopefully is a long time. Um, so I really benefited from learning the whys of accessibility um, through this course because it not only helped me better explain uh, solutions and situations to my team, but then also later on down the line when I'm presenting designs outside of the team, um, it helps, you know, put, uh, it helps give a good reason for accessibility besides just this is the right thing to do or this is the right way to do it. Um, neither of which are really strong arguments in and of themselves. So following my education, um, we did an initial audit of our site, um, which, you know, the, the best way to do accessibility testing with users is to actually do testing with users with disabilities, um, you know, and get feedback on how they view your site. Since uh, our accessibility initiative was really um, an internal push, uh, that wasn't an option. We didn't have the support of, you know, a dedicated research team to be able to take the time and um, find the people to for this initial accessibility audit. Um, so right there, that was, you know, that was a hurdle that we had to get past. And we had to find something that, while it may not have been necessarily an equivalent testing method, um, it was in the name of something is better than nothing. It was a, it was a start. Um, and so for our first audit, we, um, we identified our main buyer journey, um, the home page of our website, and then the plans and pricing page. Um, we wanted to break it into a manageable chunk because trying to audit an entire website on your first go around is um, really overwhelming. And to keep um, to keep ourselves on track, we wanted to be able to take it in bite-sized manageable chunks. Um, so uh, as, uh, as the tester for this audit, I ended up using a lot of tools to be able to um, try and accurately capture various different experiences of our site. Um, some of the tools I've listed uh, on here, some of the tools I used were Stark for color contrast and um, also seeing what various types of color blindness might look like on our site. Um, Wave is really good for like a macro view of the site as a whole um, and identifying potential accessibility issues, um, such as when images are missing alt text. Um, Axe Dev Tools was something I would use to um, turn off the CSS and the, you know, the visuals on the site so I could just see that semantic structure in place and determine, like, does this, like, logically make sense? Um, you know, you can obviously use the keyboard and tab through the whole page, make sure that makes sense, and then um, I use a Mac and Apple has some good accessibility settings where you can actually test um, various different um, various different accessible experiences uh, through their software. So uh, I used that as well. Following our audit, 
um, I compiled a list of all of the issues that I had identified in my original audit. And we got together as a team. Um, and, you know, there were some issues that were fairly black and white, like color contrast. There's not really like a middle ground there. It either um, meets the minimum requirement or it doesn't. Um, um, so those were those were fairly straightforward to fix um, uh, since we could find other colors within our existing design system that uh, were accessible and met those color contrast requirements. Um, what we had to do, though, is we had to identify these accessibility gray areas, um, you know, areas where there may not necessarily be a one correct answer, for example, alt text on icons. Um, you can put alt text on icons, but you also, if they're decorative, you don't necessarily have to. Um, so we kind of had to go into that thinking about how can we provide an equivalent experience um, for all of our users, not necessarily the exact same experience. Um, so that's kind of where the research comes in. Once we identified those gray areas, uh, I did a lot of research on potential solutions. Um, I brought solution these solutions to the team, and um, we agreed on our team's design treatment for these gray areas um, and what we wanted to do moving forward, um, which I then documented in a um, Google Slides document, um, along with visuals to help not only potential new members on the team understand, but also people outside the team who may not have been there um, from jump and may not have seen everything that we were going through. Um, and the last thing that I feel like is really important as far as, um, you know, creating your accessible design framework is identifying uh, a process to report new additions to this framework and to this document, um, you know, are you going to have a Google form? Are you going to become the point person that everybody comes to every time they have some sort of accessibility question? Um, and if that's the case, how are you going to record all of these questions so that you can get to them in a timely manner without having to interrupt your day every single time? Um, so these are all, you know, questions you have to ask yourself and things you have to decide um to help maintain this framework once you've built the framework um, and you've achieved the goals you set out to achieve you've redesigned some pages and you're feeling great about yourself you may be wondering okay what's next how do i keep this how do i keep this moving how do i maintain this forward momentum um and so like i i mentioned just a few moments ago, you're going to want to continue updating this framework um, as you continue to go through just your regular day to day design work. You'll find other either existing um, accessible gray areas or potentially your team might want to introduce a new component like an animation or a video onto a page and you're like, OK, how are we going to address this accessibility wise? So. You know, by maintaining that framework and that documentation, you make it really easy for anybody to use accessible design components um, and make sure things are done correctly the first time. Um, I've also found it really beneficial to start introducing accessibility into the reasoning um, portion of my design presentations. Um, like I mentioned when I was talking about the education, the why behind accessibility is super important, not just for your own benefit, but also for the benefit of those around you. You know, why is accessible design important to a business case? Um, who is accessible, like who is this accessible design going to be helping? Um, really says a lot more than just, we did it this way because it's accessible. Um, you know, people want to understand and people want to grow their own knowledge. And if you can really kind of help evangelize accessibility within your organization, um, you, you'd be shocked at how many people um, you can get on board. Um, and the last one, um, my last uh, piece of advice would be to pick the right times to really dig your heels in as far as accessibility. Um, 
you know, similar to uh, a lot of feedback you get on designs, sometimes uh, the accessible option isn't going to be the one that everybody likes the most. Um, and so in those situations, you have you have options. You can research potential um, other accessible designs. Um, you can, you know, dig your heels in and say, you know, no, this is like this is the best way to do it. And I'm going to stand by that. Or you can say, you know what? OK, you know, we can have tool tips on this page, but I am going to go and find a better way to present the information you want to present in an accessible way. So whether you are making a stand right then and there or um, going back to your own personal drawing board, um, you know, you kind of have to make those decisions uh, on the fly and on your own um, with the support of your team, obviously. Um, so just in closing, um, Accessibility for me is a never ending journey of education and growth. Um, I have found a lot of um, a lot of joy and a lot of fulfillment in um, the beginning of my accessibility journey. And um, something I would recommend for everybody is to find a community of people um, like all of you who are passionate about accessibility, whether that's, um, you know, an accessible design group within your company or just a, a group passionate about accessibility anywhere like Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, it doesn't really matter. Just um, find a group of people who are also trying to um, further their education and knowledge and growth and y'all can help each other and grow together. Um, and, you know, I really find that that's incredibly beneficial. So thank you so much for your time today. And uh, if you have any questions, I I'm in the chat and should be able to answer those. Um, feel free to find me on LinkedIn and we can chat more. So thanks guys. Thank you for attending our second round of lightning talks. You can continue the conversation in the chat or on social media using hashtag WPA11YDAY or w, uh, hashtag WP2022. We also appreciate it if you could go to wpaccessibility.day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentations. Uh, please stay tuned for, pst, hey you, not everyone likes videos. Uh, that is gonna be coming up next with Michelle Butcher-Jones at 6 p.m. And while you're waiting, don't forget to visit our sponsors pages to grab virtual swag and enter for a chance to win great prizes. So we'll see you right here after the break.
Okay, we're just going to do a quick sound check. Do you want to say hello and say your name? Hello, Michelle Jones. Awesome. All right. All looks good.
I think we are missing sound. There we go. Welcome to WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Jay McKay, and I'm the Director of Community Programs at Nobility. Thank you for joining us for Psst, Hey You, Not Everyone Likes Videos with Michelle Butcher-Jones. Michelle is a lover of all things open source, a WordPress core contributor, and an international speaker. She runs her own WordPress shop at 13 Core and is the head geek at Can't Speak Geek. Michelle is also a meetup organizer for St. Louis and the lead organizer for their Southern Illinois WordPress meetup and is currently working on her first book set to be completed in 2023. Um, please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A tab uh, and we will answer them at the end of the session. And please use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone has so far has enjoyed the day. Uh, it's evening where I'm at now. And we kick this off. Um, to start, I already gave my little introduction of I'm Michelle Butcher Jones. I live in Southern Illinois, um, about five hours south of Chicago land area. Um, already kind of went through everything I do. I'm also a volunteer for the WordFest um, live uh, that should be happening here in a little while and then my day jobs I am the head of support um, specialist at Thrive Agency and then I also do um, content management for Cornell University. Anymore there are videos everywhere on social media, on websites, um, people will send you videos and they are just everywhere. And there's a huge allure of videos uh, from TikTok to YouTube to Facebook. Uh, almost all of your social media platforms now have some kind of video streaming. And according to Cisco, now videos count for 82% of all web traffic. And the two biggest areas right now of YouTube and Facebook say they have over billions of views every single day. So video content is very supreme right now when it comes to the um, social media and on your websites. You see drone videos now covering um, locations of businesses and many um, like get to know us videos and unboxing videos from influencers. And why do people love them? You know, the joke of all the cool kids are doing it. And then now there's this huge wave of the influencer culture. And so many people who go from having this idea of they love makeup. So why not make videos of learning how to put the makeup on and um, what products work for them, what products don't work. And then video is great for boosting your SEO to get the Google gods happy. And then they are relatively easy to make if you're only making videos. Um, but when you're only making videos, then they're not very accessible. And when it comes to them not being accessible or just kind of other reasons, not everyone likes videos. I tend to actually be one of them who don't really care for videos. Uh, my ADHD brain, even paying attention to sitting in a movie without like playing on my phone or doing a little something else, I tend to lose interest in it. And right now, just in the United States alone, 13% of the population has some sort of disability. And with the disabilities of being hearing impaired or visually impaired or even just cognitive differences with um, can be a huge hurdle when it comes to just watching videos. And some people dislike being talked to. 
for a lot of the like Facebook live videos, when they first started talking, you would have a video of just someone sitting in there with a the phone like this, just talking. And it's almost like FaceTime, except for it's a one sided talk. And for those with me personally, two minutes, not even two minutes in, and I'm just like, okay, this is boring. And then sometimes the content can be very hard to comprehend if you have someone who is talking really fast or talking with an accent that you're not completely used to. Or there are those type of videos you see them, especially on like Facebook, where it's um, look what happened type video and or they're cooking and they check the pot for like three minutes instead of like just showing you the dish. And quite often, even without a disability or different type of brain patterns, you can get really impatient with that. And then also the quality of the video. And with quality of the video, there's the sounds, how clear people are talking. There is also like a bunch of background noise and um, visual aspects of it because some can be kind of fuzzy like if they're using their phone to record and they got a smudge on the lens it can show bad quality for the video and then people might not want to see it and then other non-accessible issues that don't have to deal with like sound and um, visual is there's also all the advertisements all the time. And right now, if you're in the United States, we're getting ready next Tuesday to have our um, midterm elections. And so with Facebook, especially, there's so many political ads and they're just all the time. Like you can watch a eight minute video with a gal talking about uh um, Egyptian history and there could be seven different videos in that five minute video ads talking about the elections and sometimes it's the same ad over and over again and then also on more YouTube than the other ones you have the subscriber pressure like click here please click here please follow me here every so often so even if you were able to keep attention to the video the every like minute or two saying click this button so subscribe here don't miss out can break your thought on it and then again of just not having a clear point to it and, and then too much fluff can make people lose interest e um, even as adults and then children also there is a limit to how much cognitive you can spend on something um typically for a toddler to school age it's a minute per year so like a two-year-old typically only has about two minutes of attention they can spend on any particular thing and even as adults we tend to kind of have that same repertoire where um there's only so many minutes that something can keep us interested especially if we're not interested in it then there's also different video conflicts that can happen as well because there's no one size fits all solution um, that comes for SEO, that comes for website builds, it comes from clothing, it comes from everything. Uh, we're just not a one size fits all type of world. And when it comes to accessibility, we always think about uh, the vision and um, audio accessibility but there's a broader area for that as well that needs to be included when it comes to videos it's your uh, neurodivergent persons who um might need more of grab you type attention to keep you interested there's the adhd brain who if you're talking about something in a very monotone voice and you're just being kind of boring that will also lose the attention of the video. Um, auditory processing disorders. Uh, for me myself, I tend to read lips to be able to understand more with the auditory processing. And that's where I will jump in and also say I want to thank the WordPress Accessibility Day team for having the ASL interpreters on here. That is one thing I've always been very appreciative of 
because I am a little hard of hearing, I do read lips. And then also as a preschool teacher, before I started working in WordPress, we would teach our younger children uh, the basic signs like milk and more and please and thank you to help them get, say their needs before they could vocally do it. I have an 18 year old daughter now who is in college and uses a lot of the sign language still for like, if you're at a loud um, basketball game, you're trying to get the person beside you's attention because you're wanting to go get a drink. So, you, you know, you're trying to yell, I want water and they can't hear you. But if you tap on their shoulder and then get the water sign, they know what you're doing. And um, with auditory processing, um, my daughter also has it as well, and we have learned with sign and lip reading, it helps us out a lot. Then also different learning disabilities. Um, there's a mixture of what can help learn at different stages. Like you would not have a four-year-old sit in front of just learning videos to learn how to um, tie their shoes. And then also at just different cognitive levels, you would want different aids for helping to learn, which goes into that there are many different learning styles and not everyone can learn from just videos alone. Sometimes a person needs more than one format to let it also in. Um, oftentimes you'll have people who are just vision um, learners who can do well with videos. But then you have your auditory people who can play the video in the background just to hear the sounds of the people talking and soak it all in. Then you have others who wants to have a video but also have a transcript of it so they can listen along to what is being done to be shown what it is and then go to try to do it with the um, wording also with it. Like for my... At work, I train our new project managers on the web team, and we have a system that is tell it, show it, shadow it, do it. So there's those four different steps of doing everything. And by the time you get through that fourth step of doing it the first time, you've absorbed all the information to do it, which makes you more successful. And when you're only having videos um, on your website or sharing them in social media and you don't have any text with it, it can make it very hard for those people who do not learn well from videos. But if you must use the videos, and I will admit I do like my videos as well on different things that keep my attention. Um, like I love watching um, the um, videos from like WordFest and WordPress.tv um, from the talks of past. And with those, though, they have a lot of options for accessibility to make them easier for people to watch. Sorry, I had to grab a drink. All videos should first include um, web-friendly text and captions and transcripts, and then PDFs that allow for audio playback when you share the information with it. This is mostly for if you are sharing them on your website, like say, if I took the video from this talk and posted it on Can't Speak Geek for people to watch. I would want to have a copy of the transcript attached to it. Um, if I was to use the logos, from the site to um, make sure they have their alt text behind them and the font is very friendly to read. And then also um, making sure that the slides that I used also has web friendly text with spacing and easy to read. And then I am a huge fan when it comes to captions on any type of videos. My husband and I both use closed captionings on our television for uh, movies. So it just makes it easier to be able to understand what they're saying, especially when you have videos and movies with a lot of background sounds. And then also for the PDFs that you might attach with your videos is to make sure that they are, allow for the audio playback to happen. 
And then going back into a little bit more of a deep dive of it, when it comes to the text in your videos and on the pages that hold them, is make sure you're choosing easy to read fonts, that there's large spacing, and that the text is also kind of a large font. Because uh, the older you get, the more harder it is to read smaller print. And then if you tend to need bigger ones of the glasses, um, those also might make it harder for you to read smaller fonts. And then also avoid animations in your text because of with animations or like back in the late 90s when the uh, marquee words were very um, uh, popular and they would have moving text. Um, that's really hard for text readers to grab onto and read in general. And then also keep in mind of your color palettes for when you use color on um, text and then for backgrounds. Remember for the contrast and highlights um, to, for important information so that it can stand out more for the reader. And also when you're using the icons and color contrasting in good fonts, it makes it so much easier for your screen readers. And then with your videos, make sure to always have the captions uh, made uh, during your live videos. Well, uh, it's really nice with YouTube that they do have a speech recogn recognition technology. However, with YouTube and Vimeo and many of the others, it's a good start and you should definitely go through and revise it to ensure that it is correct. And the best way to also do that as well is have a script that you have written out before you do your video that has everything that is supposed to be said. So once the video is done and then you have to go back in and look at um, what the YouTube speech recognition picked up, it makes it easier to switch the words out. Um, a lot of times when it comes to the um, recognition, it picks up your normal uh, words, but if you tend to use slang or have a thicker accent, then, or not enunciate very well, it won't pick it up as well. Um, like for us, people who are in the South or even more Southern than I am with the use in the y'all and the words um, like that, it tends to not pick them up as well. And in Osseo, with the video captions, they will not only pick up your words when done right, but it will also pick up all the sounds and turn them into text. So if you're making like a little commercial type video of your business and one of the things you want is someone walking in through the door and you hear the ding dong of the bell, that it will pull it in there too. So when people who are having auditory um, needs won't just hear the person talking, but they'll be able to read that the doorbell dinged and a person walked in, which makes it even more engaging to the person who is doing speech to text. Now, there are two different types of captioning. There's your closed captionings, which those are encoded in with the video. So it's kind of all one file. And then you have the open captions, which are a, decoded from an existing subtitle file. And that's usually made by a third party service. And for that, it could be whichever one you prefer, but typically closed captions work the best if you are doing all of this manually. And then one of the things I love the most about meeting videos and also training videos is to have a transcript um, to go along with it. And a transcript is, it takes all the captions and, and prints it out into a dialogue that makes it searchable. Um, and for that, I'm one who, if I do have to listen to like a Loom meeting video, I will put it on like speed one and a half to two to kind of go through it quickly. Um, or um, if it does come with a transcript, I more look at that and find where I need. And then we'll go back to the video 
um, at that particular time point. And it helps because one, you don't have to keep up with what's on the screen. Um, because especially in like meeting videos, you want to kind of skip through the hi, hellos, introductions and go down to where, oh, well, we need to figure out about building the homepage. Let me skip ahead to that information. And then they go talking into SEO parts. And if you're the developer, you don't need to know about that. And you can skip ahead until it goes into the next information. And for transcripts, it's like reading a book instead of watching the movie. And I am one who's more into the reading the books than the watching the movies because shh, they're always better. And then audio descriptions here and there and everywhere. Um, this goes for images and scenes and videos through the through narration. And who doesn't like a good narrator? Um, like we joke around about having the little um, quizzes that says which Marvel character would narrate your life or which um, uh, deep voice um, will narrate yours um, voice or which Muppet could describe your life. Um, so we all do enjoy the having the narration and it does help with transcribing um, everything to audio, but it also helps with the visually impaired. The more descriptions you can give, the more adjectives and verbs and build up you can get, the more a person can imagine it in their head if they cannot see it visually. Um, we notice this in books. Um, uh, that we uh, read like for myself I'm a huge murder mystery um, lover and there's a um, writer named Brian Freeman who actually just put up put out a book yesterday that I haven't started reading yet because I haven't had a chance but in his books he is so descriptive with the scenery with the people that you can just see it all in your head uh, and in another example is I've always been a huge Dan Brown fan um, who has done the books and the movies of like Da Vinci's Code and Angels and Demons, the um, religious um, fictional history type books. Uh, and um, see, who was it? Was it Tom Hanks who played in that? Yes. Um, and with his books were so descriptive that the first time I saw um, the first movie he did was a Da Vinci code. And while I didn't picture some of the people who actually played those characters as them, but uh, the places a lot that he did and um, some of the people descriptors um, because he was so vivid in his audio in his legible descriptions that in my head I pictured a lot of it and it was very close on and that happens with also when you have the audio happening with your descriptions an extended audio um, with giving the descriptions can give the small details of every single little action frame and that just make turns your video in a way into a really good book and they can help close the gap between what is happening on the screen and what the viewer uh, understands, pardon me. Especially when if someone can see a little bit, but it's more blurry, but also has all of the audio descriptors, it really can put it all together. And uh, for the visually impaired, you know, it can, the more description, the more they can see with their imagination. And then on the technical side, when it comes to video formats and players, you'll want to make sure you are using the best formats possible uh, for accessibility. Uh, typically that is the MP4. And then also for the accessible, for the vision um, impaired and other accessibility items. If you use more of like the Windows version or um, different things like that, then you're making the other people who say like, if you have it made on Windows using their um, media viewer and you're an Apple um, computer user, you would have to download the Windows Mini, uh, Media Player to be able to watch that video. 
Now, most of the time, Vimeo and YouTube does this automatically for making everything accessible. And then using a WordPress site makes it easy for you to embed those videos. And after the videos, makes it also easy for you to embed your transcripts and um, text in there afterwards. So it's all one nice package together on your page. And then for making the videos and editing, products like your Adobe Premiere Pro can help you get your videos of good quality and also make them accessible. And then there's some random other thoughts for when it comes to sounds um, to make them accessible that's easy to do is number one, speak slow and clear. And then also show your speaker's face. Um, so often when it comes to your auditory um, um, people is when you have someone talking like this and looking away, you can't really hear them. Um, and it's kind of like the opposite version of you driving and you turn the radio down to make sure you don't get lost. Um, it's that being able to see it, to be able to hear it. And then block out white noise when you're doing um, your videos. So like if you are wanting to record outside and, um, and there's like a light outside humming or if you're in an office and there's a bunch of just the kind of um, not really chatter towards distracting, but just your little noises kind of rubbing back and forth. And then try to avoid using filler words. This is the one thing I try the most on as a speaker, but still sometimes have issues with. And the filler words are your ums, your uhs, your huhs, or uh, to, and they are fillers to save area. And then also have a narrator to help you um, with the background audio in it. And have a non-distracting background. How many times, especially back in the, when more local radio stations were um, bigger than they are now, and they would do the live radio events and you would have the, hi, my name is Michelle Jones and I'm coming to you from our local grocery store. And those type of, those were just audio, but even in videos now where you have the person talking at the grocery store, but you have all the noise of the carts coming back and forth and maybe a child screaming in the background or a husband talking to the wife to where you're hearing all of these surrounding noises around that one person trying to talk about being at the grocery store. And you have a hard time trying to stay pinpointed on the lead person because of all of that distracting background noise. And then some random other thoughts to do for your visuals um, is again, nothing blinking, flashing or strobing. Um, this is big for anyone who has epilepsy, um, but it's also very beneficial for if someone has um, vision issues and where it is they're sensitive to light and anything like real bright flashing, especially if you're the type of person to use the dark views on your um, monitors. If you have a dark view and you start a page and all of a sudden there's this like glowing blinking thing coming at you, it can take your eyes a minute to adjust and it can really hurt them if you are very sensitive eyes. And then also with the um, flashing and strobing, there can be just very distractive as well. And the audio um, cannot pick those up. And then another thing that is really thought of quite often is the smooth movements of a camera. Um, if you watch like the Blair Witch try. Uh, Blair Witch uh, movies where they're running through the woods and the videos are just jumping everywhere. It's hard to keep attention with it. It's hard to really convey what's going on in the video because of the movement. And also it can just create motion sickness for some people watching it if they have a sensitive stomach. Um, so the smoother you can uh, make the movements of the camera and the ease of use of just going through everything, it makes it a lot easier. 
And then remember your color contrasting when it comes to making videos, especially if you're using a green screen. Um, like, um, for example, there was a couple of years ago where um, Queen Elizabeth was wearing a green outfit in one of her, I think it was Christmas talks maybe, or just when she was addressing um, the UK, but they were turning it into all different kinds of um, cover-ups because of green screen with her outfit. And there's been different times where like meteorologists doing the weather on TV would wear a green outfit. And when they would walk up to the map, they would disappear except for like their head and their hands. Um, so that's with green screen for the color contrasting. But then also say if you're wearing a white shirt like I am and you go to put on the WP accessibility banner because I'm in white and the background is in white, I pretty much disappeared. And if you be, are, are mindful of when you go into different types of um, settings for your videos, you would want yourself to stand out more um, for showing the people and not just kind of blending back with one another. give it a minute we'll wait to switch over for ASLs that was perfect timing um, other factors for accessible videos because there's more than just accessibility for the democracy of media other wins for having the accessible videos is well one the obvious of being inclusive reaching all audience both ones with accessible needs and ones who just like using the accessible needs, kind of like with um, me on like actually really enjoying watching ASL interpreters talk. Um, sometimes I'm not having um, auditory dislocation issues, but I still like using um, the closed captionings. Also videos, especially accessible videos, improve SEO scores. And of course, we always like appeasing Google to be that number one on their searches. And videos can also help with ease of use of your website when they're accessible. Because if you are having an informative site where you're wanting to teach different type of lesson plans, if you have the video plus your um slides that go through the video and a transcript of it all of those things together will help people learn um, better on your site and the most attention getting of your wallet is the more accessible your videos are the more accessible your website is lower chances you are of a legal complaint with the ada because that is something nobody wants to get into because lawsuits now for ADA can cost a lot of money. And um, for the bad side of it, it's cheaper just to make yourself ADA compliant. And then I wanted to throw in some helpful links that I had. Um, some of the information that I have in here today was grabbed from these links and also just kind of ones to have around, um, of course, going into the WCAG accessibility standards. Um, found AVA, that is uh, captionings for all. That's really kind of cool to see. And then tap, tap, C is a um, for um, vision impairs. Then we have for um, the U.S. The Americans with Disabilities Act. Google has their own um, Google accessibility where you can learn more of information with working with Google in video for um, video accessibility. The um, Ally color contrast accessibility validator for this, you can enter colors in and see if the contrast um, is good enough for to be a accessible contrast. And then the BOIA video checklist. This is actually a really great checklist if you're just learning how to be accessible with your videos or wanting to grow to make sure the videos are fully accessible. And then the Assistive Technology Industry Association. They've got a lot of great information on there. And well, it looks like I 
cut this six minutes short. Um, but I want to thank everyone to come to my talk. I want to thank both of the ASL interpreters coming to share my words with their hands. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their, let's see, 14 hours we have, I think, left. All right. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. We do have a couple of questions. Um, this first one, do you have suggestions that we can use for creating transcriptions to go with our videos? Perhaps anything free to use? Uh, there was one. I remember the name of it. Uh, Fusebox Transcripts is another good one. And then most of them, though, unfortunately, are kind of paid. Oh, we had uh, a suggestion of Otter, I believe. Yes, that was actually the one I was trying to think of. Um, I knew I needed to write those down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see, we have another one. Is there a way to get the slides without a scribe? To um, for, for mine? Uh, yes, I believe so. I will actually share those out um, at the end of the day. Mine will, um, not end of the day, end of the hour. Mine will be posting on Twitter. But if you want to go back to my slides, in the top right, there is a link that is mlb.pw slash WPAD2022, which will take those to speaker deck and um, they can be downloaded there. Great. Um, this was a question about the MP4. Uh, what is it about the MP4 that is more accessible to visually impaired uh, than other video formats? Um, it's mostly with, for the MP4, they are able to be played on almost all players where, um, your QuickTime and Flash, which yes, they still have Flash around, um, Windows Media Player tend to only want to be played on those type of media players. But then also, um, the MP3s, it's just kind of like your uh, like PHP level, WordPress levels and stuff. It is um, accessible, but with the newer MP4s, it just makes it a bit better. And the code is written just a little bit more tighter. Okay. Uh, we had another one. Do you recommend a particular plugin for e-commerce sites? If it's just the code, Kodak can, let me... If it's just the codec compatibility cross browser and cross OS. That might be from a different session. I think that one, yeah. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, we have another question that just popped up. Um, if you had to choose between video and audio, do you think that audio has a broader appeal than video and would be better to just do the audio and text rather than video and text? Me personally, I am an audio and text type person. Um, with th doing this talk, when it came to like looking at the different things with accessibility and for me on personal, I don't know how many times like I would go to like have an email that's talking about like a breakthrough for um, diabetes care. And I'm like, yes, let me get to this. And it's goes to just a page that is a video that's like 32 minutes long, no transcript, no closed captioning. And I'm supposed to watch this thing for at least 28 minutes before I can click on a link to take me to what they're actually selling in the information. And usually with those two minutes in between my ADHD and my neurodivergent brain, I am done. <laughs> but with being a preschool teacher first, um, and then I've taught on with uh, Beginner's WordPress and then being a trainer at work for our team, 
there's so much more beneficial to the mixture of things. Um, and I like it so much more where there's, you can just listen to the audio, you can just read, or you can do the video, or you can do the mix of all three. But if I had to choose, especially the, I'm just going to stand here and talk into my video, or the not have an option, give me just the audio. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm I'm exactly the same way. If if it's just going to be talking at me, I I'd, I'd much rather have a transcript. So I I agree with that one. Um, I just wanted to uh, give out that address one more time for the slides. It's M L B period or dot uh, P W slash W P A D twenty twenty two. I believe we've also put it in the um, ideas uh, tab as well on the. Um, channel. Okay. Oh, next one. What is your opinion on background videos? Are they very annoying to you? Do you see value in them for others? Um, I can see the appeal in them, but for the love of everything that is good, do not make the audio play automatically. Because how many times, especially if you've been sitting in a quiet room and you go to a page and it's almost like the clown from the uh, Garfield Halloween episode where the clown's like, hey, kids. And it feels like that when you go to these videos and it's all of a sudden just, well, go to the websites and it just sound cr crazy. But like the little short videos in the... Um, header area can be great and um then also like a little moving background for a gif can be nice i just recently looked at a real estate site that had a huge hero section where behind it was a drone flying through st louis and it was on a continuous loop so it never stopped and if you paid a little too much attention to it it kind of made you motion sick yeah, that's, that's never a good feeling. Um, oh, we have another one here. If we're making a product demo video that is, um, excuse me, let me rephrase that. If we're making a product demo video, is there a specific style of demo videos that you think works better? As long as they're engaging and the person has interest in it, um, in like, really just authentic engagement in it uh, then they demos typically work better and it's definitely a talk about it show it but make it a quick move through because sometimes they're like let me give you these 74 different points that you're not going to care about and then show you how it's gone where it's more kind of like how we first learned to write papers where you give your intro blurb, you give the meat, and then you give your outro blurb to it. And sticking with those type of concepts for even demos, where you give your elevator speech, do the demo, answer, do kind of like a FAQ type thing at the end, uh, tends to make it better. Where as like a lot of these cooking videos, where, or even just the cooking recipe pages, where you have like 10 miles of fluff and then you finally get to what you want. And the more of getting what you want tends to make the demos, unboxing, any of those type of videos better. Um, I'm, this is just for me. I'm curious in terms of if you have any advice in terms of how to um, maybe script out or plan your video before you actually get to hitting record. Um, for that, what I've tend to have done is just build out almost like a script you would do for doing a play or even um, like making a movie. Um, just kind of do it on a small form because it might just be you. But write out like especially what you want to say and then practice it a bit um, so that you're comfortable with the wording of it and then go into it and if you're doing something like this, you can always have the words on the one side and still be quite engaging and just glancing over for reading it. And that having that all written out, it makes you 
not do as many of the uhs and ums. It makes it easier for the transcribers to pick it up. And it also makes you look more confident in what you're saying. Me, on the other hand, when it comes to doing talks, I am the queen of, you're going to get to my talk and then about 17 other side stories. <laughs> We're going to go on a journey with you for sure. All right. Well, we have just a few more minutes. Let's see if we've got any other questions popping up. Um, but I could just chat with you all day about this because I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit too on the background videos. Um, and I think you brought up a really good point about that not having the audio um, and also about, you know, having ways to stop. Do you have any recommendations for those autoplay background videos, like maybe how long they should be if they're going to loop or any, any additional uh, information for those? Well, depending on how long that video is would depend on how long the loop. However, typically a person's not going to stay on that above the fold area more than about 20 to 30 seconds. So really that should be as long as it will take and even if it is a little area down below that's not the above the fold that like say you want someone like giving a thumbs up um to um like trying to get someone talked into signing up for something still typically any given area they don't spend more than about 20 to 30 seconds on so really that's as long as it needs to be and then if you do want it as a continuous loop for longer, you've got to think the longer that video is, the more resources is being pulled from that site, which could make the site slower. And then you have even more issues than just it being um, more accessible. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, wrap us up, but please, um, if you have any questions, please, uh, pop those in the chat right now. But I want to thank you all for attending our session. Uh, actually, not my session, Michelle's session. <laughs> hey, you, not everyone likes videos. Uh, please continue this conversation in the chat or social media using the hashtag WPA11YDAY and hashtag WP2022. Uh, we also appreciate it if you could go to wpaccessibility.day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentation. Uh, and please stay tuned for our next session, Developing Accessibility First WordPress Themes, uh, coming up next with Nicole Garcia and Annie Heckel at 7 p.m. And please, while you're waiting, don't forget to visit our sponsors pages to grab virtual swag and to enter for a chance to win great prizes. So thank you, everyone, and we'll see you right here after the break.
It would be helpful if I unmuted myself. Can everyone just give me a quick hello and what your name is so we can make sure audio is working? Yes, hello, Danielle. Awesome. Hi, it's Annie. Sounds good. Nicole. Great. Um, and Nicole, will you be sharing your slides? Yes. So if you want to go ahead and hit present, that will pop it into the green room. It won't be visible on the stream, but that way okay. we'll have it ready when I need to add it to the stream. Do you, let me see, I'm going to try to, um, do you add it from Google Slides or you just present the screen? Probably the screen. Um, yeah, either way, if you do share it from, like if you insert the slides, then you'll have to change the slide on the video. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, um, you might want to just share your screen. I'm going to. Oh no. Um, let me see if this works because um yeah. Hang on. Um okay. I'm trying. It's a privacy thing on Mac. Oh my God, I have to quit out of everything. That's okay. Oh God, okay. Um, You're good, sign out and come back. Yeah, uh, hold on. I'm going to pull us out of the stream and we can talk in the chat. And if I need to, I'll put us back in so we can talk verbally. Okay.
Hello. Uh, welcome to WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Danielle and I'm the founder of Overnight Website and Kinetic Iris Web Development Studio. Thank you for joining us for developing accessibility first WordPress themes with Nicole Garcia and Annie Heckel. A little bit about them. Nicole works with local educators and community partners to teach technology to students and those who are new to the industry. And Annie is a web accessibility specialist and educator currently working to ensure that Cornell University's web properties have as few accessibility barriers as possible. Please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A tab next to the video and we'll answer them at the end of the session. You can also use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. Hi. Who's live now? <laughs> okay. Um, Hi, uh, sorry. Um, I'm gonna move through my slides here. Um, first of all, uh, I'm Nicole and Zanny, as we were introduced. Hey. <laughs> um, uh, so when I told Annie that I wanted to do a talk about making accessibility first themes, she was a little surprised. Uh, she was from the uh, um, Ally community already, and everything is accessibility first for her. And I said, this is not this way in development, where accessibility is kind of added on after launch or in the form of a checklist or like the request of a client, uh, if it's added on at all. Uh, usually developers have no workflow to allow the space for the accessibility or the process to architect or test it. And so hopefully this talk will help everyone gain a new insight on in how we can make this work for agencies and teams. I also kind of wanted to show the audience that accessibility auditors and the developers who have to perform the code um, editing aren't really against each other. Uh, in our former jobs, I even survived an audit done by Annie's company and, uh, and we're still friends. So that is a possible thing. Um, so accessibility first, uh, what do we mean when we say accessibility first in the context of this talk? So I'm looking for an architecture that provides the best ex user experience for all users. The architecture puts accessibility before coding and design is done to save money and time as the components won't need to be recoded or redesigned after they already created in a non-accessible way. So putting that effort into the architecture guides the overall development process with all the stakeholders from content and marketing to design and development. All right. So here we go. So Nicole's going to go over a number of different possible approaches um, as we get into the, the presentation here. But no matter which of the following approaches you use, keeping these basic elements of accessibility in the forefront as you create your theme will help you to make good decisions. Following the principles of perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, which made guiding concepts for WCAG version, version two, as everybody who knows WCAG will know. And then falling back on WCAG can make it a lot easier to ensure that you're at the very least meeting the accessibility baseline. Then build for the end user's needs and not for the needs of developers and designers. If you think about end user needs, you're more likely to shift away from the minimum accessibility and get into actual usability, just going beyond that baseline that we get when we adhere to week to WCAG. And then, of course, as always, um, semantic HTML is, is always the big thing. So whenever you can use it, whenever you can build it in, always do, since it usually has the accessibility support built right in. So that said, do keep in mind you can't cover all the bases. There can be some things where designers and content creators have to step up and take responsibility. This was a lesson I learned in my previous life as a college professor. I could never anticipate all of my students' mistakes, so I just had to be able to kind of roll with it and deal with whatever they threw at me. 
So of course you won't be able to stop the users of your theme from making some bad choices in terms of design or content entry, things like poor color contrasts, um, misusing the heading tags. But if your theme's basic framework is built for accessibility, that'll make the end user experience better pretty much by default. All right, back over to Nicole. Okay, which brings us to, speaking of uh, designing for users and not the people who have to use the site, or the, you know, the people who own the site, um, WordPress site builders. So a lot of times when we talk about building themes, we talk about, you know, how they're going to be assembled. And site builders is one of the ways in which many people choose to build a WordPress site. Um, <clears throat> they're very popular. A lot of clients ask for them but they come with a lot of accessibility problems. Uh, you know, like I'm saying, if you kind of give anybody the ability to just style things at will, some really bad things can happen. For example, um, this might be some of the code that you generate the site builder. You know, the content, to, to, um, the editor for the content can come along and they can add things and these, two things could look the same on the front end to the person editing the stuff. But for a accessibility, you know, view, these are very, very, very different things. Obviously, they don't have the semantic, um, you know, tags to them. Um, they can have very different meanings when you look at them with different devices. And that's where we're trying to move away from the style of development. So for avoiding the site builders, what should we use instead? Uh, for the best accessibility and a truly built-in process, and I'm gonna go back through this several times about having a built-in process, because the more you can have a built-in process, the less you have wiggle room for accessibility to go very wrong. So for a built-in process, you're probably gonna know, need to go the development route. And um, we're going to go through a few paths today to try to figure out what that looks like to make a truly accessible development process. So one of the options is headless. Um, headless sites separate the WordPress content management from the front end delivery. So you have your content being served by the normal WordPress content manager, and then you pull it out um via rest or graphql so most of the front ends for headless are now uh javascript apps or static html sites which are lightning fast um but the biggest argument for that is that uh if it's for accessibility as you can give your users options on what front end they would want to see or you can change the default based on what device or browser the user has while headless is the most development intensive. Um, I do believe it can be streamlined into being much easier. There are many hosting services that make headless deployments easier, like uh, WP Engine has a service called Atlas. With headless, you can also separate design from content and limit the content into ways that make accessibility support easier, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, most of the headlet sites now use Reactor View in the front end, although I've recently been enjoying um, doing some Gatsby static sites. Uh, so that's another option too. So custom themes. When it comes to custom themes and accessibility, what you want to do is not recreate the wheel every time. If you start with an existing theme and have to add on all your supports in a piecemeal way, like add a plugin here, plug in there, change a few things, things are bound to get left out and the process takes a really long time. And then companies start to complain about the development cycle being too long, about things going wrong. That's when it really goes wrong. So if you aim for a build process, instead of building a theme by hand, you can add in the accessibility supports without having to create them from scratch. You then replicate your base each time and then add your final touches with styles and components to create a unique site much like this um, gif of building the car, uh, you take this blueprint, right, that builds your base car, 
And then you get to add the paint and trim to make each car unique. In the resources in the end, um, I've added some links to a few th theme frameworks you can use to get started with uh, this route on the <clears throat> in the repo. Um, if you start with a base that has a built-in process um, like WP Rig or Sage, you can add your components to that and keep building new themes on top of it. Each site looking unique, but st sticking with the same base um, accessibility components that you have set for. Sorry, I'm struggling with my braces and they stick to my lips every once in a while. Uh, so that uh, framework flow, right? So how do we put this together and make it easier for an agency to have the custom building process while also adding in accessibility? So your first step is to identify the common elements used in multiple sites and put them together in one place. So this could be headers or menus or footers, call out boxes, forms, um, you know, and so on. It's important to like lay down the scaffolding for accessibility and styling, but not to assign specific styles to your base. Like you're gonna add the specific styles later for the individual theme. You just wanna kind of create your base that has all of your components that you want. The idea here is that it, accessibility supports are built into the process and the framework. They won't get left out. Making them default makes them included in the end. You can also include the list of plugins you're gonna label as must use, um, such as advanced custom fields, which we'll talk about a little bit if you wanna use that, or say you want to um, require Yoast to make an automated site map to add new pages to, because that's very good for accessibility. Okay, so this is what it might look like. So on the top here, you have um, your base theme building materials, your components, your supports, your must use plugins and your base styles. And that is your, your base repository that you're gonna start all of your themes from. And then on the bottom, you're gonna add in per site. So you have your custom styles and uh, your images. That's gonna be on a per project basis. You then combine them into a build process to make each individual theme. Um, this process is nearly the same for headless and for custom theme sites. So for headless, you might have two build processes outlined. You might have one for the, um, for the actual theme, and then there one, might be one for the front end. And then for the custom theme, you might just have one build process for the theme. Um, and then you might need a document that outlines the setup of your site and any plugins. So limiting content, and this is the part where we get in a little bit of trouble with uh, the other departments in, in an agency. Um, why would we wanna do that? And what does that mean? So when we were talking about the site builders, um, we're talking about how users can do some crazy things. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to guide and shape and give them like some rules about what they can and can't put into, uh, into the pages. So we're limiting the number of inputs that they can be added to the editing screens. They can't free build the thing and then hurt accessibility. All of the code or all the content would be pulled into a code layer. So it's separating the code and the content. We can also use this um, to add functionality automatically to the content, such as adding uh, read more links to the headings. Because we had the content providers just add in the words and not make links themselves. Uh, we're going to do two examples of this. One is a Gutenberg example for the Gutenberg builder in, um, in WordPress. And the other one is with um, ACF for advanced custom fields. Okay, so 
if I wanted someone to make an alert box in the content, I could tell them to do a standard code block and put some code in an editor like this. Um, it might get the job done, but it's also not very standardized and it allows for a lot of error. So if I want to add in, uh, you know, other sort of supports into this, I can't do that because you know we have these code blocks and they're they're set into the to the content so alternatively if i could make a custom gutenberg block so this is when they're doing the the uh, page editing and they would add this block and their only options are to choose what uh what kind of alert they want and to put the text in there. They don't have the option of just free coding it. They don't have the option of, you know, reinventing their own wheels here. They can only do this. Um, this helps for two things. One is that, like I said, they, they, they don't have the option of just making it up there. <laughs> and two, say if the standards change later, the accessibility standards change later, I can just change the block in one place and make this thing appear differently later. And I don't have to go through every post and find every block that we use that way. Um, we're not gonna specifically discuss how to make the blocks uh, in this talk, but I did um, post some of the resources to the, the repo for this talk, um, if you were interested in learning how to do those. So uh, here's our other example. It's advanced custom fields. Um, this is nice because it's a much more user-friendly sort of thing. Like you can use, you know, you don't have to have people with coding knowledge who can go in there and, and be able to add the fields. Um, so here, say we have a post and at the bottom of the post, we have these special fields for our run details and we have a purpose and a distance and it limits how people can enter text in here because they don't have to remember to add the distance. They don't have to remember to remember purpose, but it also pulls their content in a way that if I wanted to link the distance to, you know, a chart or something, I can do that. I can also add any sort of supports I need to the content that gets pulled out in that way. It separates the content from the presentation, basically. ACF also makes blocks now. Um, with the latest pro edition of ACF, you can make these custom blocks that you can use with uh, a WordPress post or the site editor, full site editing. And so here the developer has um, defined a quote block uh, that someone who is using this quote block can only make the quote text and the author and the title and then add an image. They can't do anything else with the block. So this block can have supports built in to the front end to display in a proper way to based on user preference. Um, if the user wants dark text, light text, larger text, they can do all that because it's not locked in to the content. The nice thing about the ACF and the ACF blocks sorry, brace is sticking, are that they allow you to export the fields and the other structures that you create. So they can be used on multiple sites without someone having to manual entries, um, manually enter the stuff on all the sites. So it's part of the build process to include these fields and blocks in your theme and not a manual off one thing that makes it easier for you to not leave anything out. So just some general tips to kind of start wrapping up. Um, one that I kind of had to get in as the accessibility person is a warning about ARIA. Because um, one of probably the most common things I see causing a big failure when someone's been trying to make something accessible is that they heard about ARIA somewhere, somehow, and somebody told them that ARIA can make it all better. It can make it communicate with the screen reader and it'll be all great. And so 
people will just kind of take Aria and sort of sprinkle it in like some kind of magic accessibility dust, which it is not. Aria is awesome. But um, the first rule of Aria is essentially don't use Aria. More realistically, it's don't use Aria for something where you can actually use HTML instead. If you've got semantic HTML that will do whatever it is you're trying to do with ARIA, always use the HTML, not the ARIA. If for some reason you can't use the semantic HTML to do whatever it is you need to do, that's when you start to bring in ARIA. But if you bring in ARIA, make sure that you know how to use it. It's very exacting. It's got its own specification. So if you want to use ARIA, you've got to make sure you go learn the ARIA specification, figure out what the relationships are, what different ARIA roles can be used on, and what different ARIA states and properties, like, can you use it on this component or not? Um, can you use it on this HTML element or not? Because there's a lot of, a lot of rules, and ARIA states and properties are not all global. Some of them are very, very limited and can only be applied to certain things. So with that, no ARIA is better than using ARIA badly um, because I don't think I've yet seen anybody really mess things up by inappropriately applying ARIA, but you can make things confusing. Um, a good kind of, for instance, on this is that the ARIA label is one of the things that probably pops up the most often. Um, it's an attribute that you can use to add an accessible name, an, an invisible and accessible name that you won't see on the screen, but that'll get picked up by assistive tech. The thing that people don't always realize about RA labels, aside from the fact that you could only use it on interactive like user interface components, is that if you put an ARIA label on a component, and you already had a visible label for that component, like say a link. If you had a link that was actually around some actual text, and then you put an ARIA label on the link, the ARIA label is gonna take the place of the link text that was visible. And if you have something different in the ARIA label than you had in the visible text, that can get really, really weird for sighted users who happen to also use a screen reader for whatever problem. So. No ARIA is better than bad ARIA. So if you're going to use ARIA, make sure you know how you use it. Go look up the specification and be careful. The other general tip is that less is more. Don't try to do too much with any one component. Um, and the good example here is don't have your main navigation add you know, every single page that you come up with. Because if you have a really gigantic main navigation, I mean, we all know how mega menus feel when you try to get into them and you can't find that one thing that you want. Imagine having that happen if you can only hear the page coming through. And so instead of seeing the giant mess of text, instead you're just hearing more and more and more choices. So you wouldn't want to have a main menu that, that has all the things in it but you do need to satisfy multiple ways. So instead you do something like what Nicole mentioned earlier, having a site map that automatically creates links to new pages as you add them. That way you've got all of the content and all of the links there for a multiple ways um, fulfillment, but it's not always front and center where it's gonna hit your user, the end users with cognitive overload every single time. So, Make sure you're careful how you're using components. Don't overload any single component and just kind of consider carefully how it might come across to end users before you do too much. Okay, so um, sometimes I get some pushback from clients like they want a specific thing that is not good for accessibility you know or they're asking me to do something that may not be the best, the best idea i do recognize that in the end they are the customer and i can provide them with the strong arguments but i can't always win those 
but I can move into the compromise phase. Like, how can I get the end result that I want while letting the client have what they want? Like, say they want a site builder. Can you build training or documentation materials into your handoff process to get them some be best practices? Um, if they want functionality that is not friendly to all, can you build alternatives into your scope and pricing structure so that you are giving a complete package whether or not they ask for it? Um, if you can talk them into certain functionality by pointing out facts of the potential problems created by ignoring accessibility or show them additional benefits maybe, like for example, this piece helps both accessibility and mobile users navigate your site, which represents whatever percentage of your traffic. That might be a good convincing argument for them. Yeah, I always like to also, so we've, we've got the carrots, the like, maybe this will bring more traffic, you know, this could be really good in this way, in this way. This sometimes we do also have to hit with a stick a bit. And I like to, one of the ones I like to start with is kind of guilt. Um, and that's if they're being really resistant to something that's a particularly important accessibility support, like if they really want to use this one component that they have found somewhere from another vendor and they're like, this is so cool, but it's say not keyboard accessible. And they keep at it. We start by asking them, okay, so what users are you comfortable excluding here? Are there people that you don't want to be able to use your site? Um, and getting into that, it, it's kind of an empathy exercise, but also just kind of making them understand how people are going to want to use the site, need to use the site. Um, you know, you don't want to exclude users. And usually if you ask a client, okay, who are you comfortable blocking off from your site so that they can't be here? They can't use it. They can't look at your product. They can't look at your content. Often they'll kind of startle and go, wait, I don't want to block anybody because why would you want to block anybody? And having, having them start to understand, you know, how many people actually do have disabilities um, at any one given time, it's something like 26% of the U.S. population has a disability, whether it's permanent or temporary or situational. Um, and if you can make them understand that having accessibility barriers means that actual real people who are just trying to do whatever it is that's being offered on the site, trying to access this service, trying to access this product, trying to access this content, they, they just want to be able to do the same thing. Um, if you can get your clients to understand that they are putting a barrier in the way of somebody, that can often help a lot because nobody really wants to cut anybody out that way. There is also, of course, the final big stick of, well, you know, somebody might get mad and sue you, but apparently from the studies that have been done recently, that doesn't have nearly as much of a, a positive effect as just reminding them that, yeah, people want to use your site and they won't be able to if you do this thing. So reminding them of the real people, the real end users who are going to want to use their site and who can be blocked from using it is really always a, a great approach to use because, I mean, accessibility support isn't special. It shouldn't be seen as something special because the people who need the accessibility support are just trying to live their lives and do the same things as everybody else. Yeah, I also get, um, I did get a little pushback sometimes from designers because as a developer, I want to make things that are, um, you know, flexible and responsive. So if someone wants to put in their own user style sheet and they want to adjust the, the fonts on there and they want to change them and they want to change colors and like, I, I'm totally okay all of that, but you know, this is their artwork. But it's also a consumable, you know, art that is di dictated by company policies. So if you work together <clears throat> as a company to build in the requirements, like favoring these flexible, responsive designs over perfect, or you build in um, certain requirements about buttons or spacing or menus or things like that, 
you can serve everyone on every device better. So if everyone can learn to like, you know, as a company, like I said, just make a compromise, then they can kind of work together and, and get some of the stuff done. So um, I did put up a, res a resource list and um, and code snippets in the um, in a GitHub repo. So if anyone wants to go look at those things, um, you know, we'll I'm sure we'll have the link available for you too. Um, and uh, thanks. And those are our contact information if you want to find us. Um, <laughs> I do apologize if anything that I was saying is not very clear because I'm still struggling with the braces. So if there was anything not clear, please feel free to find me later and ask me. <laughs> okay, looks like we do have Q&A. All right. So take, so I just want to take a second to thank you both so much for your presentation. Um, as a reminder, you can enter your questions in the Slido Q&A tab. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, the first one, uh, we'll, we'll get your perspective on um, and see if you know anything about. They, the question is, how do you handle sitemaps for very large websites. Sometimes I've seen sitemaps that are just giant alphabetical or date ordered lists. So how do you guys handle those? Okay, Nicole, did you have anything? Because I've got one I can probably pop a good example. Go ahead. Okay, so one of the things that we, we worked on recently um, at Cornell is our the university newspaper. And as you can guess, there's like tons of articles all the time. And so we don't have a sitemap that has every single article. Um, so instead, what the sitemap does is it organizes things by category. And the sitemap, there are certain tags that articles will have. And each article, every single article get, that gets put up will have one or more tags on it. And so the sitemap does tags. It has those tags that are used to categorize the articles. And if you click on one of those tags, it'll take you to a list of all of the articles that have that tag. And so when you have that, you combine it with a site search and that gives you the, satisf the satis way to satisfy the multiple ways requirement without again, like serious cognitive overload because you're smacking your end users with like everything all at once. Because yeah, <laughs> Giant alphabetical date order lists are wow. I mean, they're technically accessible. I don't think, yeah, WCAG doesn't have anything that says they're a failure, they're just cognitive overload. Yeah, do you have any kind of do you have a user style sheet kind of thing and then a like an XML version for search engines, or do you just use the one and it, it just links the categories? I am not sure. I would have to go ask our design team. I'm always curious about how people handle their site maps as well. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten too far out of the like actual day to day work. So mm. like, I know that they they have the things that they built to do this and do it right and do it accessibly, but I don't right. know exactly how they work. Yeah, I would definitely say that kind of stuff begins with a content strategy because mm -hmm. um, if your site maps are just a, bunch of giant stuff dumped there, you probably haven't thought out your content strategy very well to categorize and tag and whatever else um, those things. So there's probably better ways of breaking up content. And that's not even an accessibility thing. It's kind of like in every problem. Mm -hmm. Because if you haven't broken your content into ways that it's easy for people to digest, then you probably have a bigger problem. <laughs> <laughs> so right. right um totally so that that definitely makes some sense um so the next question here uh that we have um when you're building from an accessibility first perspective are there certain themes or plugins that are part of your default starter theme or do you just build everything from scratch 
No, 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 no. Um, I definitely, most recently I was um, building out um, the two different things I, I built out recently. One was using WP rig, which is, um, you know, it's a, you start with your base thing and then you can add in all your accessibility for your uh, menus and footers and, and add functions in it. And then it just becomes a build process. So like, say, I have the rig set up and it's customized for, you know, whatever the company is doing with it. Um, and then I can add in specific things that one site needs, run the build and makes the theme. And then I can switch out those components for a different site, like add in new components, run the build, it makes the theme. And so it's, it's kind of like a little, you know, factory blueprint that way. Um, the other thing that I've been doing a lot of stuff with lately is, um, is Gatsby and Gatsby has a lot of um accessibility supports built in so you make your wordpress site you make your little gatsby site it pulls it all out and it makes it into a static site but it has all these little supports that are built in so you can make the process and then you can keep on replicating that process for new sites cool makes sense um to just to double back real quick on site maps we got another question in for that um they are often in the footer of a website. Should it be visually located somewhere else or does it make sense that it's always in the footer? I would I, I would not put an entire site map in the footer. Um, like it's like you wouldn't want to have the entire site map in the main nav. Anything that somebody's going to have to go all the way through to get to other stuff um, and footers count for this because there's often stuff at the very end of the page that people want to get to like terms, privacy, things like that. Um, and I mean, if you don't have a giant site, sure, you could have all the page links there. But if you've got a big site, you'll want to have the site map be a separate page. And you can link to that from the footer, which is, that's completely- Right, posted. but would you put it somewhere else too? I think I would actually put, if I if I was trying to do something for, um, to make it most accessible, especially if I had like, you know, a mobile menu situation where you could just drop drop down the thing. I'd probably put it at the end of the the menu oh, too, yeah. so that you can hit it from the, you can hit mm -hmm. it from the top and the bottom. It's not like in the way of anything, but it's nice if I'm like, you know, I don't really want to make someone have to go through an entire page to find the sitemap, and I don't want to have to make them like click through seventy five things to find the sitemap. So, yeah, you know, making it from the drop down menu or from the you know footer is fine. Um, Again, multiple ways requirements for the nights. You put yes. it in the main menu and then in the footer too. At different spots you can get to it from. Awesome. Yeah, I mean that totally that makes sense. It's hard because you don't want to break patterns too much because people yeah. come to expect certain things, but then there are pattern breakers and rule breakers, and that tends to set up new trends. So maybe we're developing a whole new trend here by putting sitemaps into the mobile <laughs> menus in the header. Um, I like it. So if we move on to when you were talking about designers seeing their work as art, um, what are your strategies for working with them who see it as art rather than a way of sharing information? Do you have specific scripts that you fall back on or um, other strategies that you use? I mean, that really needs to be a company decision like it can't come from the developers because <laughs> no one's close to the developers anyways um but that needs to be a top-down decision like if we put people first then we need to put people first as a company decision kind of thing um and then it that would trickle down to everybody of how they see things um i think a lot of companies that will invest in uh ux designers will tend to have more interest in how people are experiencing the site. Um, you know, so looking for people that are or companies that are doing user experience more than, you know, we make pretty stuff um, is definitely important. But I definitely think that, you know, like I said, no one is no one listening to the developer. So it needs to be like a top down thing, you know, from the product managers or from the, the you know, down from the CEO. Like it just has to go all the way down um from the top and 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 be a company decision so it's also a place where the very mean accessibility people can come in i mean if we have to use the stick of like no you're not allowed to do this because accessibility like it will sometimes raise some hackles but it can get through 
Um, but I mean, it, the the uh, like, who are you willing to exclude approach can also work there. It's like, okay, this is your art, but are you really wanting to put a barrier in that will keep some people from being able to use this? Like, if you've got this really like complex line design that's got some neat depth perception stuff, are you really okay with the fact that some people will look at this and get dizzy and not be able to go further into the site? Um, there's also the design challenge. Like, are you, you know, the kind of designer who can't rise to the design challenge of making a, an attractive but accessible design? And that's, I think we can use the same stick on developers too. <laughs> this is a challenge for you. And if you're a good designer and a good developer, you should be able to make this work. I know you can do this. <laughs> I love I like that, that approach. <laughs> you can try a little bit going there and that can, that can work in your favor a bit challenging their intellect yep. and they'll prove you wrong. I love it. Um, it feels a lot to me. So this is another question that came in. It feels a lot to me that custom blocks are really the future for making components the most user-friendly and accessible. Has your experience at Cornell found this? And I would add on to that, the idea that they literally just launched the block locking features and things like that. Um, so does that make you skew towards custom blocks or do you still stick with ACF? How do you approach that? Um, I would say that, uh, yeah, the block stuff in, in WordPress 6.1 is kind of gonna be huge. Um, it's both as a developer, it's both like fascinating and it's also scary. Because it's like, oh, you can now full site editor. I'm like, oh, oh no, oh no. <laughs> Look what they're doing now. Um, I definitely think that, um, I don't think ACF is against the blocks. I actually think it would work with it. And I think they're gonna, about to update all their stuff to work with WordPress 6.1 too. Um, I've been using the nightly build or whatever of WordPress for a little while to, to play with it. And it's working really great. Um, so I don't think it's against it, but I definitely think that we're going to see, um, I think that WordPress is starting to learn from the rest of the development community and they're starting to learn components and things like that, that other languages have been doing for a while. So, um, definitely it's, it's going to be what we're going to be doing. Um, I do think that, that ACF or a tool like that makes it a little bit easier for the rest of the team because they can just, build stuff out the way they want it and then the developer can just export the json file and then they can put it in the you know that just makes it easier rather than making it like okay you got to give me a list of the things that you want on the content page yeah so that kind of makes those processes easier um so for a workflow thing it might be easier but but definitely everything's going to be about blocks and and um and how to uh you know make custom blocks and how to um just make that easier. Um, I'm I'm still trying to work out how it's going to work with the full site editor. That's going to be um, a little bit scary and weird. Yeah. We'll so see. it sounds like the answer is it depends on the requirements of the project, as always. Yeah. yeah. No, they they are. It is simply like, it's going to go much. You know, like if you're not already doing custom blocks, it's it's going to be the thing that everybody's going to be doing now. Like they're just going to be selling custom blocks. You know, yeah. as a as a service kind of thing. So. It's yeah, I know our, we're doing. Our, develop, our custom development team at Cornell does, we like do custom components and have like a demo site where it's like, you can have this and you can have this. And so they've got like, you know, things that our clients can go look at and they can make a choice about what it is they want to include on their site. And we'll do, you know, minimal modifications because they've already made them accessible. So mm -hmm. it, it helps a lot, at least for the parts of the university that come to us for their sites, which is not everybody. Universities being decentralized as they are. Well, speaking of that, we have um, one last question. Um, yeah. How does Cornell handle enforcing accessibility standards? Is there a review team before a new website can go live? How does that work? That is difficult. Um, so universities, are really decentralized. This is probably one of the most challenging parts of my position because I'm the, I'm basically the top dedicated web accessibility person at Cornell. Um, and so 
I'm the person everybody's supposed to come to for web accessibility information and things, but I don't have a lot of enforcement mechanisms. We have a policy, an official policy that says everything is supposed to meet WCAG 2.1 level AA as a baseline, um, but they don't have to go through the custom development team that I'm housed under in our central IT. They don't have to use us to build their websites. They can hire an outside vendor to build a website. Um, so we, because we have literally like thousands of websites at the university, thousands of different, different properties, we have some core university websites that get checked on a regular basis, anywhere from like once a year to once to every 18 months or so that we our my team does an accessibility review of those sites as often as we can manage it. Um, if a site's not covered under that set of core university sites, it is the responsibility of the unit that owns the site, like the particular college that owns the site, it's their responsibility to make sure that it stays up to date, stays accessible, doesn't have problems. Uh, so ideally, yes, there is a review before it goes live. And that's one of the services that we try to make sure everybody at the university is aware of. But realistically, it doesn't always happen because there is just so much People. going on. So <laughs> it's hard. That and, and vended, vended products is my other bugbear. Um, because I deal with a lot, of, a lot of vended products. But yeah, so we try to make sure that everybody gets some kind of accessibility review. Everybody is responsible for keeping them up to date and at least at WCAG baseline. But when there's so much of it, it's really, really hard to get. Do you have up. any like resources that you give to people in, in regards to that, where if they say, hey, you're going with someone else, make sure they do this mm -hmm. to at least make it easier? Yeah, I mean, we do have a university-wide site improved subscription so that they can do at least the basic automated checks because right. site improved yeah. does a pretty good job of catching what you can catch with automated stuff. Um, we have a WCAG checklist that we developed for the accessibility team's use, but that we make available to the rest of the university along with an explanation of how to test everything. Um, so there's that. And then trainings, offering trainings every single month on on doing accessible, how to do testing, basically automated tools, manual testing. And I get, you know, at least a half dozen people in each of those every month. So it's, they're interested. Everybody wants to do it and they're taking advantage of the resources. That's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, it's making everybody's responsibility and then make sure they can get the information they need to do it. It's really the way to go. So. Awesome. Yeah, well, that's awesome. and super helpful perspectives on small and large teams and all of that. Um, so I just want to say thank you again, um, both of you for, you know, having a, an extra long Q and A so that we can ask you some of these very <laughs> important questions. Um, so thank you for attending this session with Nicole Garcia and Annie Heckel, and you can continue the conversation in the chat or on social media using hashtag WP a 11 Y day and hashtag WP 2022. We also appreciate it if you go to WP accessibility dot day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentation and stay tuned for our next um, topic, which is accessibility is a partnership that requires communication. It's coming up next with Maxwell Ivy at 1 a.m. UTC, 8 p.m. Central. And while you're waiting, don't forget to visit our sponsors pages to grab virtual swag and enter for a chance to win great prizes. See you here right after the break.
Oh, it would be helpful if I unmuted myself. Hi, Max. I put you in the feed for just a minute so we can do a tech chest test. I'm Ooh. sorry. What now? You're coming through a little loud. Uh, okay. I sound too loud. Yeah, and there's also a hit a air sound in the back. Like, I mean, I doubt they can hear it, but I just wanted you to know it was there. Um, okay. Well, I was just checking on your audio, so we've got your audio. Um, yeah. Is my audio good? Yes. You do have the light off in your room in, so we cannot see you. Do you want us to be able to see you on the video? Well, does that help any? Because that's what Yes. I that's that's quite helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, and then I don't I don't have complete control over this room, so sometimes my stuff gets moved. That's okay. <laughs> um, will you be sharing your screen today? No, I will not, because I do not have any slides. Okay, perfect. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to pull us out um, for about six minutes, and then we'll put Danielle, our host, in, and they will introduce you, and then you'll come back on, but you will be removed from the feed. Um, there is a private chat on the far right side for me visually. I'm not quite sure where it is. I for think you. that's where it is. I think that's where it is in the reference to a screen reader because it does. That's the way you navigate. So, okay. So if you do need to talk to us, um, we have screen reader tested it and it should work for you in the private chat. Okay. Um, if you could, whoever is going to be in charge, if you could have them like give me a like one minute left before the 10 minutes we have allotted for Q&A. If you could just have them tell me that it's about time to take questions or something like that, that would be very helpful. Yes, you'd like a verbal. A verbal reminder or prompt, yes. Yes, we can do that. I would appreciate it. Okay, uh, we will. I'm gonna remove us from the stream so we will not be able to talk to each other for five minutes. All right, thank you.
Hello, welcome to WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Danielle and I am the founder of Overnight Website and Kinetic Iris Web Development Studio. Thank you for joining us for Accessibility is a Partnership that Requires Communication with Maxwell Ivy. Max has transformed himself from a totally blind, failed carnival owner to a respected amusement equipment broker and is known as the blind blogger. He has written four books, been interviewed on over 350 podcasts, started teaching people how to be great guests, began booking people on shows, and eventually started his own podcast called What's Your Excuse? Please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A tab next to the video, and we'll answer them at the end of the session and use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. So Max, take it away. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to my community, that being the WordPress uh, users and developers. So thank you for this. And I want to let people know that while we want the internet to be 100% accessible, I'm not here to slap your hands or scare you that you're going to get sued. I'm here to encourage you to see accessibility as something that has a value to you, to your business, to your profitability, to your competitive advantage, but also that you don't have to do this alone. Because I've realized that creating accessibility on a website is hard for your information, because I think it's relevant to this conversation, I, when I first got online in 2007, I did not have access to WordPress. So I had to teach myself how to code HTML. I had to, to write Java and I had to find people who would loan me Java and PHP code to put into my website to make it do things I wasn't capable of making it do. Uh, and I did that for five years. And so I've got a lot of built up horrible code in my background that eventually will all eventually be updated to not only be pretty code, but be accessible. So I understand what it is to be a website owner, to be a small business owner, to have limited skills, ability, talent, or money. And then to have somebody come along and go, oh, wait a minute, your website isn't accessible. You need to make it accessible. So I just want y'all to know that I understand where you're at and I'm gonna do my best to make you feel better about this, the process and challenge you and encourage you to take action towards making your products and services more accessible. So first, it isn't easy. If we just take accessibility for screen reader users, and that's not even the entire visually impaired community that will use a website. If we just go to screen reader users, and I'm doing that because that's my area of experience. Uh, if we just go there, we have two different operating systems. We have Windows and Mac, which I'm sure y'all are both aware of that. But within those two operating systems, you may have two different screen reader options. So for Mac, you have VoiceOver, if you create a program or a website for the iOS devices, which is Mac's uh, mobile option, then you have a whole nother uh, standards or rules that you have to code by to make your app accessible. And you look at Windows, you have Microsoft. And with Microsoft, you have JAWS for Windows or NVDA. These are all screen readers for people who have no vision or very little, or at least have so little that they have to depend on a text-to-speech option. So. Uh, and once you get past Microsoft, you also have Android. And Android is now doing much better with their TalkBack app to where it is becoming accessible, with, at least with sighted assistance during setup on quite a few things for the Android device. So Android is coming along. So you've got all these different platforms. In addition to that, you have different levels of visual acuity. Uh, somebody that has a high level of vision may only need some small amount of screen reader accessibility. Somebody who has a, a real need for total screen reader use may have sighted assistance. And then even beyond the technology you have available to you and your ability, you have comfort level. So depending on the training you have received with your devices or the training you have never received with your devices, uh, that's going to affect how comfortable you are trying certain types of things or trying to figure things out as opposed to requesting or, or even demanding that accessibility be addressed more fully. And then, and I'm 
then you have to remember that even people that have the same visual acuity and the same disease, we are all still human beings. We are all still individuals who happen to have vision loss. So you could give two people with the exact same circumstances, the exact same question, and they would find two different ways to arrive at the answer. So I just want to wait. So no, I understand that this is not easy, but just because it is challenging doesn't mean that we don't do it or that we can't do it. And because it is challenging, it gives us the opportunity to stand out until everybody else on the internet decides to come along and make their websites accessible. And by the way, I do want to applaud WordPress because WordPress has done a lot in the area of making their platform and the apps that play on their platform accessible. And I have had very little uh, real problems with anything from WordPress for the last three years. So I want to applaud WordPress for their investment because not only do they spend a lot of time on the back end, they address this with people who want to create plugins and they address this at every WordCamp session they've had for who knows how long now. So I want to give them their props. And uh, so just because it's, diff because it's difficult, because a lot of people don't do it, it gives you a way to stand out. So think about this. There are roughly 1 billion people in the, in, the, in the world that have a disability. I think it's probably about 300, 350 million of those have a vision loss disability. So we're talking about a pretty big pool. And I'm sure you've already heard those numbers. But here's a number I believe you haven't heard. Only 3% of websites on the Internet are accessible to the, to the agreed upon standards for access. So that means that if you become one of those companies that has that level of access, that makes people like me, uh, people with autism, deaf people, people in wheelchairs with motor issues, you make us feel welcome. We want to spend our money with you. And I am quite often t spending time talking to your business owners about how, as a rule, the disability community is very brand loyal. We will stick with companies that invest to show us that they appreciate our business and want us to be part of the solutions to make their products or services more user friendly for us. We will tell our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers and our social media networks. And if we find something really good, we'll even tell our enemies about it. You know, because we just want to advocate, we want to help each other and help each other deal with our accessibility issues. So if you think about it, by making your product more accessibility, making your website more available, you're, you're gaining an entire marketing department, thousands of people who won't have to be paid a dime to tell people how good you are. So it, it is hard, but there's a definite return on the investment. So I said that in my title that this was, I was going to talk about a partnership. So I personally believe, and it's been proven out in my own life for years now, that we can only get so far with compliance. Even if we had a perfect set of standards, even if they were adopted on a global level, even if we had perfect enforcement of those laws, that would only get us so far because there would still be a certain number of people who would either find a way to avoid the law or would, who, would do just the bare minimum to avoid being penalized by the law. So I personally believe it's a lot, at least a good part of this means uh, saying hello, this is who I am, these are my needs. Uh, I would really appreciate it if you could make this thing accessible. And so I want to share a couple of examples with you of experiences I've had with companies, a couple of them pretty large companies actually. And just so y'all know, just so I don't get any, any trouble with WordPress, uh, I do not have affiliate links for these people. I'm not getting paid by these people. I just mentioned them because they're, they're part of the example. And I think that if people didn't know who I was talking about, the, the argument wouldn't make sense. So as a blind person that's been online, that's had a website for over 10 years, well, over 15 years now, uh, I have been in a lot of situations where I just didn't have a way to make it do what I wanted it to. And that continues up to today. So what I usually do is if I go to a company and I'm going to use their product or service, or I'm going to spend a lot of time on their website, I go and find the customer service person or the technical support person. And I send them an email and I say, Hey, I'm Max Ivy. I'm totally blind. People know me as the blind blogger. Uh, I 
have a website and a podcast, and I'm planning on using your offering. I don't expect to have problems with it, but if I do, I would like you to know who I am because I would hate for my first message to you to be me, sub me t submitting one of those tickets saying that you got a problem. So that's where I usually start. And as a result, I've had a lot of great conversations with people on that side of the company. And I think a lot of it is because I reached out to them before I had a problem and the conversation started off as friendly. And of course, if I understand if, if, uh, if there are people watching who would take the alternate side of, of that position, but I really do believe we have to help them and they have to help us and we can't do that unless we communicate and collaborate and work as partners or at least try to. So about six years ago, I joined a platform called Nepris, which is a free online e-learning platform that connects teachers with professionals, experts, in order that they can come on Zoom or other virtual platforms and give talks to these teachers' classes. And I heard about it and thought that sounded cool. So I filled out the form to join the website, only to find out that very little of the website was accessible. So I sent them an email and explained my problem. And of course, the first problem was that I could not create a profile. I couldn't tell people who I was, what my background was, or what my favorite topics to speak on were. And without that, they would have no way to know if they wanted to select me to speak to their kids or not. So uh, they scheduled a Zoom call with me. We spent about 30 minutes discussing my background and what I wanted to speak about. They created a, a profile and an email document, sent it to me. I reviewed it, made a few corrections to it, sent it back to them. And so we got that up. Uh, they put the categories I wanted to speak to. And I was just so thrilled in 2018 when I finally got my first classroom booking. They wanted somebody to speak to a group of kindergartner and first grade students with special needs in Chicago. And I get the link, I click the button, I can't click the button. So I reach back out to them and go, you know, hey. And so they asked me which time slot I wanted. They scheduled it. And they also told me, Mr. Ivy, when you get ready to give this talk, uh, we're going to send you an email with a direct link to the Zoom room. And the reason for that is having a website where you deal with lots of young people, there are privacy issues, so they can't run Zoom. Just in Zoom, they have to run it within a secured platform on the back end. So they sent me the link. I logged on. I had a great conversation with the tech person for 15 minutes before I talked and had a wonderful talk with the school kids in Chicago. And I felt just amazing after I finished that talk. And I was thinking, you know, if I had just gotten mad and went off and said, no, nah, I'm not going to worry about this, or if I had decided this isn't important enough to me to want to be part of it, then I wouldn't have done it. But as a result, I've given over half a dozen talks on the platform. I've talked to school kids from elementary school to, to high school all over the country. And I even recently received an award from them for the talks I've given and all of that stuff. Now that I'm, you know, working at being a speaker, all that stuff comes back to me now where, you know, I can say, hey, you know, I spoke to all these different school kids. So without letting these people know what my problem was and giving them an opportunity to fix it, I wouldn't have been able to use the platform. But now on the other side, though, is while we were doing it, through what people would call a hack or a workaround, they had their people working on the back end to make it more accessible. So now there isn't a single part of their platform that isn't accessible. They did just merge with another company called Pathful. So perhaps as they merge the two systems, there'll be a few hiccups, but they understand my needs and the needs of other people like me. And the other thing that's been really cool is they have started an initiative to really invest in including more people with disabilities on both ends. They want more schools for the blind and other institutions that have young people with disabilities to be able to have access to these classroom lectures. And they also want to find more people with disabilities to give talks because they realize there are literally thousands of us that have expertise, that have experience, that have lived experience that could help 
teach these kids and they value that. So uh, that was my first experience with Depris. And like I say, it took a lot of communication, understanding, communication, and they've gotten there. And now I'd say they're probably an example. Uh, another experience I had was with a company called Podmatch, which is a place where people can find podcasts that want to book them on their shows. And it's run through artificial intelligence. And when I first started using it, it had two issues. The first issue was unlabeled buttons and unlabeled links. And we've all been there where you end up having to count links, just like you would count steps back in the old TV shows or movies in order to figure out, well, if I press this link, I get this page. So I, in, in this case, I had actually met the owner before he started the company and we had been friends. So I reached out to him and I said, you know, this is a real problem. And we talked about it. And even though his company has been growing really rapidly, he's been working hard to get the tech people to make more accessibility improvements and also to, to fix some of the stuff that was already there. But the other part of dealing with him is I learned a new expression. I learned about something called workflow. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but maybe you aren't. So the thing is, is sometimes a problem with a website is accessibility. But sometimes a problem with a website is workflow because the person who designed it doesn't understand how a visually impaired person navigates a website or they don't understand what a logical process would look like to you. And in this case, he has a he has a, uh, a system, a series of buttons that you push in order to book a conversation with somebody on the website. And I could never find the button that I needed, but I finally noticed that near that button was a button, or excuse me, I never found the button, but I noticed there was a button that said schedule appointment. So I clicked that button. And after I clicked that button, another button popped up that said uh, request connection or accept connection, which was the first step in the process of booking an interview. So as, a, as somebody on that side, on the developer's side of building this website, they didn't understand that that didn't make sense to me as a screen reader user because of how I navigate websites. So I've had to explain that to him. I've also talked to him about how not having the option to click a mouse button is very troubling for people with uh, screen reader users. And that if you're going to use mouse clicks, there really has to be a keyboard command option that's an equivalent to it. And they have to be made available in a way where I can go somewhere and get a list of all those keyboard commands. So that when I visit your site, my experience is friendly and fun. And I can focus on uh, meeting people and making the connections and booking the interviews as opposed to, oh man, what do I do next on this website? So um, he did, did take some of my suggestions and they're continuing to invest in the website and upgrade the accessibility. It's just they, they are a small team, but that's one of the reasons why I'm impressed by them because we all know there are lots of websites being run by huge companies that are not accessible. All we have to do is look at the headlines to see some of the companies that have been sued for lack of internet accessibility. And then the, the third example I wanted to share with y'all was with the organization uh, podcast movement. They run a very prestigious uh, national conference on podcasting, something I wanted to attend and actually wanted to speak at. But when I, re when I visited the website and went to the forum, the forum was not accessible. There were selection boxes, but they weren't the kind that my screen reader could navigate easily. I couldn't uh, select something and have it stay where I put it and then press uh, enter or, or the control on it and have it select the item. And I was very disappointed because the deadline was coming up to apply. So, I, But I reached out to them. I explained my problem. And they had somebody export the application to a Google Docs form. Of course, I had to explain to him, hey, Google Docs isn't a whole lot more accessible than your website. <laughs> so, um, but I was able to export the Google Docs file to a text file. And I was able to enter all my information and send it to him in that file. 
Uh, he navigated it, entered all my stuff into the form on the website. Uh, he also helped me update it so that I could include my photos and my links. And the fact that I want to give a keynote, if the, if the opportunity comes up for me to give a keynote plus my workshop. So, and the really cool thing about these guys is they want me to let people know that they did not intentionally uh, try to exclude people with disabilities. They just did not realize what they were doing. And I find that quite a lot when I talk to people about their websites, but they did not know, but they did promise me that by, ne by the next time they have a call for speakers or a call for any type of opportunity, they will have a accessible form. They asked me for my advice and I told them, keep it simple, use a, go use a Google form and leverage the work they've already done on accessibility because I've never run across a Google form I couldn't complete. So these are three examples where it was, it wasn't because I said, you know, you have to do this or else. I didn't threaten to sue them. I didn't threaten to go on social media and call them out. I just said, hey, I would really like to be part of your company and use your website. And these are my problems. And could you help me? So we were able to get that done. Now, like I say, it does require that both sides want to communicate and collaborate. And there are going to be times where the website owner basically just blows you off. They do ignore you. They don't pay attention. And sadly, when that happens, then you have to fall back on compliance. But my daddy taught me that it's a, that more often than not, I can get what I want with a, with a smile, a handshake, and asking nicely than I can by telling people they're a big meanie. And if they don't do it, or they better do it or else. So, and that leads me to something I have also found out from the companies I've I've spoken with over the last few months is I like to ask people, do you have any visually impaired people using your website or using your product or service? And in the last two months, I've had four, four conversations with that particular question. And every single time, the answer is, we don't know. And then I have to ask them, well, why don't you know? Of course, I don't say it mean like that, but I do have to ask them. And their answer is always the same because... No one living with vision loss or any other type of disability ever tells us that they're using our product. They never go, hey, I'm here and your product is great, or I'm here and your product is horrible. He said, we just, the people that I've talked to say, we just don't hear from the visually impaired users. And I would be willing to bet that that's probably the same for uh, users of all types of disabilities. Now, I understand that deciding whether or not to tell people you have a disability is a personal matter, and I'm not going to say everybody should do it the way I do it. I will say it works the way I do it, and I spend a lot less time cursing and pulling up my hair than I would have otherwise, but I understand that a lot of people just want to be able to be treated like everybody else as if they don't have a disability, so I understand that. Uh, in this case, though, I am trying to get things moving. I'm trying to get things to become more accessible. I'm really trying to get the developers on the platform and outside the platform to decide that they want to make their websites accessible. And that's fine. If, if it's because they're scared, that's fine. If it's because they have a real true desire, that's fine. If it's because they realize they can make more money, that's fine. I'm just trying to do my part here to make it easier on them because this is hard and this is scary. So I've uh, I've been working with people, uh, trying to get them to make their, their websites more accessible based on what I know. And so if you own a company, you probably are asking yourself, but what if I don't have the ability to connect with somebody like Max? You know, how do I create this partnership so that I actually create a accessible website from the beginning so that the whole development process from the idea to the design, to the construction, to the distribution, to the growth and updating, everything along that path is up is accessible or updated so that it is how do you do that well there are quite a few places you can go for starters 
there are plugins and other automated overlays that you can install on your website that will offer some level access of accessibility. And I'm not going to say that those things are wrong or that they're horrible. Uh, there are some that are better than others, but if you're going to use automation, please try to find one that is built by people that have disabilities, but they have a team or they at least have a community of people where they can know what the most usual problems are and they can adapt for them, they can develop for them, they can figure out how to update your website. Uh, and if, if at all possible, a overlay or a plugin that includes human review along with uh, the automated reviews and updates. So that's, that's one way you can do it. That's easy, that's anonymous, and or it's at least a closed system where only a certain group of people are going to know about it. The other thing you can do is while there, that while we are scattered and there are lots of us, there are various advocacy groups in the country that have people, some places it's a team, some places it's email list, but they have people that you can reach out to who can give you feedback on whether or not your website is accessible. So I would recommend uh, groups. I'm not going to mention the group by name because I really don't want to start any. I don't really don't really want to start any disagreements over whether which you know which websites I mentioned and if I leave somebody out. But uh, you can do a Google search and you can find those groups that can help you see if your website or product is accessible and give you ideas on how to fix it. The next thing you can do is you can create a team in house, and it doesn't have to be a huge team. It does have to be a paid team. I, you know, as for what you would pay them, I'll leave that up to you and them to negotiate. But it would be great if you had an internal team of people representing multiple disabilities who could give you regular feedback on what you're developing and how accessible it is or is not. And uh, also give you their opinions on workflow, on does the way you interact with the website make sense in addition to accessibility? Because as I mentioned earlier, those are two separate things, but they're also... They're both a big part of whether somebody can enjoy using your website. Uh, in addition to that, make it easy for people to contact your technical support and your developer team. I understand you that you don't want those people getting hundreds or thousands of emails, but possibly a place where the emails you do get can be curated into a bullet list of the most common concerns and then passed on to developers. Uh, reach out to individual users. If you are on the internet, you can see people that are doing great work. I mean, like, you just have to Google the blind blogger or what's your excuse and you're going to find Max Ivy. And there are lots of other very talented creators who have disabilities, podcasters, authors, speakers, YouTubers, Instagrammers. So, uh, you can easily find people with disabilities and you can invite them to give you their opinion. And perhaps y'all can work out some sort of an affiliate arrangement or an endorsement schedule or something to where both sides get something out of it. So make it, try to find ways for people like me to contact you so we can share our concerns and consider reaching out to people like me, like many of the people that are going to speak during this accessibility day and going, hey, we would love for you to give us your input. By the way, I just had an idea. Go to the list of speakers and just take down all of our names. And those who aren't interested can say no. And those who aren't interested can send me a message offline and tell me thanks, but no thanks. I hope I didn't just make somebody bad. But uh, when ideas like that occur to me, I generally speak them. So there are lots of people speaking at this event who would be perfect for you to ask for our help to make your products more accessible and to avoid uh, breaking things in a way that creates hard feelings and makes it hard for you to put it back the way it was. And again, make it easy for people to connect with you. Make it so that we don't have to own the product. We don't have to have a subscription. We don't have to have spent money. Just make it so we can reach out and go, hey, I didn't even get past the sign up screen and I already had trouble. Or 
I signed up, but I'm not enjoying my use. Is it possible you could address this, this, and this? Make it easy for us to connect with you. And on my website, the last thing I want anybody to do if they're thinking about hiring a public speaker or hiring a publicist, the last thing I want anybody to have to do is to have to dig to find my email address or my contact form. I want them to be able to find me right away. And as a business owner, considering how valuable accessibility can be to you, I wish more would think, yeah, I don't want to make it hard for people with disabilities to let me know that we could make this better. Uh, so advocacy groups, internal staffs, reaching out to influencers or other people, asking your staff member if they know any people with disabilities they could introduce you to, uh, attending events like this where you can meet people and decide, hey, I'd like to know that person and have them be part of our team. That's all great stuff. And if you build it and you maintain it with accessibility, then it takes a lot less work once you get started. So I really hope that this is making sense to y'all and y'all are realizing that we can make our stuff accessible if we want to. And then if we decide to do it, we have the potential to reach new audiences that are going to stay with us as long as we continue to make them feel welcome. So I hope that does help you some. And really, it is a partnership. I mean, I could not do what I do without WordPress doing what they've done over the last 11 or 12 years. I think, I think this is their 12th year now um, because while I could use one of the other content management system websites, none of them are as much fun to use as WordPress. And if you notice there, I said fun because I don't like to have to think about what I need to do next in order to update my website or create a new blog post or upload a video. I like to be able to go step, step, step without having to think about it at all. So I just want you to think about it. I don't expect you all to do it, but I really hope that you do. And if after, if after, after hearing me speak, you decide, you know, I would like to try to make my website more accessible. Then, and you, then I'd like to hear what you do to make that happen. Uh, be more than happy to provide any advice, opinions, or suggestions I can to anybody that sincerely wants to make their stuff better and make it more inclusive. I, um, and <clears throat> so whether you're a big company, a small company, a sole entrepreneur, there are always ways to accomplish the difficult things. And accessibility is no different than trying to locate new customers, coming up with an elevator pitch, uh, building a, an e-commerce store, or any of the other stuff we have to do in order to try to make money online. And if, if, I, if I have time, I would like to share just one more example because it comes from a very small company. It comes from a company called Less Annoying CRM, which stands for Client Relationship Management. And I'm very big on business through creating and maintaining relationships as opposed to selling. But I send out a lot of emails and make a lot of phone calls and it's hard to keep track of everything I've done. And I've looked for accessible programs and couldn't find one. And it turned out that they offer one. It's very friendly, very accessible. And the thing is, this company only has 19 employees, yet their product competes with Salesforce that has thousands of employees. This company only makes three million, I know I'm fixing to say only makes three million a year or grosses three million a year, which I'm told is less than 1% of what Salesforce makes. But their website is clean, it's uncluttered, it's friendly. And even though they have to use a drag and drop, they went out and found an accessible drag and drop to include in the part of the website where you create your workflows for your own uh, internal use. So it can be done. Please don't let the size of your company, please don't let your lack of ability or skills be an excuse to keep you from making your website accessible. Just remember, the more fun it is to use, the more people that will use it. The more people with disabilities believe we are included, the more money you have the potential to make. And since I'm hearing voices in my background, yeah, I think that means I'm through. You've got about five minutes left if you still had more to say. No, I think I'm good.
I think I'm good. Awesome. My, my speaking coach always says, Max, if you get to where you think you're through, then stop and, and give them a few more minutes of question and answer. That's valuable advice for sure. I kept having questions to ask you and then you kept answering them. <laughs> it was an <laughs> excellent presentation. <laughs> Well, thank you. I was really concerned about it. I have had these conversations with a lot of people over the last few years, but this is the first time I've given this talk. And I was, uh, I won't say that I was nervous because there are people who wouldn't believe me if I did, but I was at least concerned that um, I was giving a talk for the first time to an audience I really care about and really wanted to do well for. Yeah, well, and you can tell. So uh, we do have one question so far that came in. Okay. Um, they said, I love your approach that you help website owners do better with a smile and a handshake, but will you share what is the single most frustrating thing that you encounter on websites and what would be a better experience for you? Well, I appreciate that because that sounds like that's coming from a developer or a website owner who wants to know. So uh, I would say the most aggravating thing that happens to me is when I go to a website to fill out a form and the forms either aren't labeled or the label is off to the side and it isn't connected to the field. So just to uh, explain this for somebody who isn't really sure what I'm, what I'm talking about here. When you use a screen reader, your general ways of navigating the screen are tab and shift tab. And in a perfect world, a form would announce the field along with any instructions for that field as you come to it. So like if I press tab and the first field wants my first name, it should say first name. But quite often it doesn't. It'll just say edit or blank or empty or something on. And I will have to use my arrow keys and go word by word or line by line to find where I need to put the information in. So if you're using a form, be sure to test your form. Have somebody who uses a screen reader test it for you and make sure that it's not just accessible, because as, as I said earlier, there can be things that are accessible that are not workable, that have poor workflow design. So if you're using a form, have it tested. Send it to somebody and ask them if they'll fill it in for you and tell them if they do, you'll give them a social media shout out or something to make it worth their while. Yeah. Um, but on a top of that, code. <laughs> there you go, a discount code. Exactly, exactly. Um, but, it, but beyond that, just to finish off the thought about forms, the other thing that just really ticks me off and I don't get mad about much is if I manage to make my way to the end of the form and then for some reason the, the way they have coded the submit button I cannot press it I can't tell you how aggravating it is and the longer the form is the matter I get you've been there too yes um yes I am, I am a web developer so I test very many forms and I do not enjoy it at all yeah, so that's that's one of the worst, is and especially because you're already invested. And it's also the worst for the website developer, because think about it this way. If I spend that time and get to the end and I do reach out to you, which I, there may there is no guarantee I will reach out to you. And if I do, there's no guarantee I won't be I won't use some some negative language, let's say. <laughs> but think about it from the side of you point of view of, of your folks. Wouldn't it be easier for your folks to get an email from somebody that wasn't already wound up over an issue like this? I mean, it's it's in your best interest to test the website form or anything else on your website because you eliminate aggravation. You avoid hurt feelings. And trust me, if any of you have watched any of these, these police uh, incidents that escalate, quite often they escalate because the people involved are already upset. And as a webmaster, we really want to try, try to avoid making people upset without thinking about it or for no good reason. I mean, I would really I'd really have to be convinced what their good reason would be to break something like the form. But, you know, you're basically just saving your team a bunch of aggravation. And you may even be protecting. Well, actually, you could even be protecting your brand by avoiding things like broken forms and missing alt tags and uh links that i don't know are there because they have no alt information my screen reader can't find the link you know so these things they they're small things individually but they add up they're cumulative they show disrespect and 
the more of them there are on your website, your blog, your uh, your podcast player, etc., the more likely it is that your tech support people are going to get a phone call or they're going to get an email and they're going to walk away from their computer and throw something or go to the break room and get coffee because it's like, man, what did I do? <laughs> no, that's that's a great point. And I'd, I'm really curious how certain things would perform like save as you go and other things like um, if you're having trouble with this form kind of thing, like I wonder how those can be implemented to aid rather than interrupt too. Right. Well, I love save as you go, but there are a couple of issues with it for a screener user. One is I need to have a way of knowing that it's in play hmm. and a way to know when was the last time it updated because hmm. quite often with those save as you go things, they don't report to the notifications settings on my screen reader to tell me that something just popped up on the screen. So knowing that it's being saved or having the set last saved time marker that most of them use next to the submit button would be are very helpful things. Just make it easy for me to know if it's being saved or not and then be able to find the place on the screen where I can see how long ago did it save it. Uh, another thing that's really good, and this is – in addition to save as is, uh, I can't tell you how many times I fill out a form and I don't get an error message and I press submit and it goes, everything goes, but it never tells me that I was successful. It doesn't say thank you. It doesn't say your submission was received. It doesn't say nothing. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes I can go to the URL and at the end of the URL, you can see where the URL has changed because your submission, your submission went through. But most of the time you can't. And if they don't send you a confirmation email, because um, a lot of them don't automatically do that, and a lot of them don't have that checkbox to select to have a copy sent to yourself. So you, if you don't know that it's that it's done this, and you have two choices, you can either sit there and, and wait, you can try entering the information again, you know, you can get mad and leave. So there really aren't good outcomes for the other person if I don't know what I'm doing based on the information that I can find on the screen, and of course, with a screen reader, that is text characters, that is images that have been assigned alt text, those are buttons that have been assigned alt text, those are links that have been ex actually given names instead of instead of <laughs> unnamed link. So, yeah, but I love uh, I love save saved as um, especially on websites like. Uh, I'm part of Speaker Hub, which is a is a is a great site for finding opportunities to give talks. In fact, that's how I found out y'all were holding this event. So it's a really cool place. But uh, their save as is one of those things. Half the time, I end up and and I've talked to them about this, but they're based in another country. But half the time, I after I'm through, I send them an email. I go, hey, I just did this, this, and this. Did it actually get done? Because I can't right. tell. So having good support is important. Uh, oh, yes. So, so we have a quick question, and then we have um, a, another more in-depth question. So we're going to okay. try to get right. through them quick. So we have, right. what screen reader technology do you use most often, and why? That's our first. Okay, it depends on what I'm trying to do because my Mac and my iOS de devices display things differently. So in some cases, it'll work good on the Mac, but not on the uh, iPad or iPhone. And in other cases, it'll work good on the iPhone, but not on the Mac. So uh, generally, social media works better on my iOS devices. And generally, uh, more complicated websites work better on my desktop. I also have, thanks to Computers for the Blind, I also have a Windows computer that I use. And I'm using it actually right now because um, StreamYard doesn't play well with my Mac. Got it. Got Sorry it. about the answer. It was a little I wonder if the before. Windows works better for government sites <laughs> since they're usually well, more outdated. I try, I try to stay off of government sites, but I think <laughs> you're onto something. <laughs> um, so our next question is, um, do you use the classic editor plugin in WordPress or the block editor to write posts? And if there was a list of top things you would like to see fixed in the admin, what would be on that list? Okay, I'm going to start by saying something that may appear to be negative about WordPress, but it's it's honest, and that's my number one uh, guiding principle. I was not happy when Gutenberg came around and we started adding adding all this block editor stuff. Okay, 
Uh, I do run the classic editor on my websites. Unfortunately, one of my websites has been out there so long that even when I run the classic editor, the block stuff still shows up. Right. But I have figured out how to navigate the block stuff. I don't mind having to use the, you know, move block up and move block down buttons. Uh, and I've even figured out that if I stop using um, double line returns, that it'll stop adding paragraphs when I where I don't want them. So, uh, but in general, I'm very happy that they added the option of going back to the classic editor. I think for most people that are running a one page or less than five page website through their uh, WordPress account, that uh, classic editor is the best, simplest way to do it. Uh, and of course, you know, you have to decide on what plugins you're going to use beyond the classic editor. So, but I, I'm still very happy with WordPress because trust me, I coded my own code for six, for seven years and I still have nightmares. So I'm very happy right. with WordPress. So but you're yeah. optimistic in the direction it's taking. If there oh, were, yeah. if there were stuff that you want to see fixed, what, what would be on that list? I would say, the, uh, I would say maybe maybe limiting or decreasing the number of items on the same screen together. Hmm. I find that one of the things that bothers me as a screen reader user is when I have too many options on the same screen together. And like, for example, when I open a, my WordPress dashboard, there's always like the uh, thanks for using WordPress. There's always like, there's, there's stuff off to the top left and the bottom right that really I don't have a, a need to see as I'm editing a post or a page. Right. So I'm thinking if there was a way, maybe in classic editor where I could press a key command to just show me the, uh, the stuff that's in play for what I'm doing, I think that would be really cool because when you're using a screen reader, the, the more objects there are on the screen, the longer it takes you to find what you want to find and the, the longer it takes you to navigate back and forth between those things for like, for example, um, I have a podcast, I produce a podcast and I've helped other people start podcasts. So I have the, the power press player from blueberry.com installed on my, on my websites and it works great. It's very accessible both on the back end and when people come to listen to the podcast, but I have to go from the, let's say upper third all the way down to near the bottom and I have to go back and forth and back and forth in order to get the file uploaded to Blueberry, the, the, the URL from their site verified. Uh, so it's it's just one of those things. If there was less less real estate to navigate, that would be a big improvement in my opinion. But Right. And back to that workflow that you were talking about, if you do things in order, put it in the order on the screen so you don't have to keep going back and forth like that. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so we have a quick follow-up question. We have about two minutes left um, regarding the screen reader technology. Are you using JAWS, NVIDIA, or the built-in operating system accessibility tools? Now, for Mac, that question is a little different because they have different programs. But right. which, you know, are you using something that you install, or are you using built-in stuff? Okay, I'm using VoiceOver on my Mac, iPhone, and iPad, which those are built-in, but I personally think we gloss over the amount of time you invest in configuring the accessibility options to your particular taste. Right. Uh, and then of course, on the Windows computer, I have played around with Narrator. I haven't really been all that happy with it, but I think it's because I'm I'm kind of old school. So I, I've, it hasn't really done anything for me. I have yet to try NVDA. I use uh, JAWS for Windows and I find it pretty good. It's just that sometimes, uh, well, and this is a Windows thing more than a JAWS thing, actually. Sometimes it just seems like my stuff is always updating when I don't want it to update. Right. <laughs> right. Um, well, awesome. I mean, thank you so much for all of the information you gave. It is all so great. Um, thank you for your perspective and definitely check out the, um, bio that has all of your info to read more about you. It sounds like you have such a fascinating story and uh, I can't wait to read more about you. <laughs> well, thank you. I look forward to that. And, and when you visit the website, uh, please send me a message or 
send me an email and it's just in case anybody else wants it, it's just ask at the blindblogger.net is where people can get me. And I love having conversations as I tell people all the time, you don't have to want to buy something from me. You don't have to want to book me. You don't have to need to hire me to talk to me uh, because I, because I find it quite often those friendly conversations with no destination turn out to be the best things. Love it. Thank you so much. And thank you for attending this session with Max Ivy. You can continue the conversation in the chat or on social media using hashtag WPA11Y day and hashtag WPAD2022. We also appreciate it if you go to wpaccessibility.day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentation and Stay tuned for our next round of lightning talks coming up next at 2 a.m. UTC, 9 p.m. Central. And while you're waiting, don't forget to visit our sponsors pages to grab virtual swag and enter for a chance to win great prizes. See you right here after the break.
Hi, welcome to WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Danielle, and I'm the founder of Overnight Website and Kinetic Iris Web Development Studio. This session is a lightning round with three short talks that have been pre-recorded. Our first talk in this session is Getting Started with Accessibility, presented by Gregory Hammond, who is a website consultant at Gregory J Development. There will be no Q&A during this lightning round, but please use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. And Gregory is here in the chat and in Slack and can answer your questions there. So take it away, Greg. Why is this beginner talk in WordPress accessibility day? It's because it's great to have a refresher for those who may consider themselves to be experts. And if you're a beginner, then it's great to know what the very, very, very beginning step should be. And if you're somewhere in between, don't worry, you will learn something from this talk. All the slides I'm showing are available for viewing and downloading at your own convenience. The link for that is bit.ly forward slash WPAD 2022. If you're posting on Twitter about this talk or this conference, you're welcome to tag me. I'm at Dev Gregory. That is D-E-V-G-R-E-G-O-R-Y. Let's get started with why accessibility is so important. I'm sure it's been covered in this conference already a ton. However, it is great to remember that one in every four people identify as having a disability. That disability could be something that's visible or something that's completely invisible. You may know someone who has a disability and they proudly say, yes, I have a disability. Or you may think, oh, I don't have somebody who has a disability, but they themselves think they do. Accessibility is so important because it shows that you care about everyone and you want them to be able to access what you have to offer. If you don't include accessibility, you could not include 25% of your potential audience. That may not seem like a lot, but it's 25% could make a big difference. Since this is a WordPress conference, you want to make sure you choose a theme that is accessibility ready. If you use themes from WordPress.org, it makes it so much easier to find these accessibility themes. If you go to WordPress.org forward slash themes, you can choose a feature filter where you can search, where you can go under the features and select accessibility ready. When you search for those filters, you will see about at this time, a hundred different themes. That may not seem like very many compared to how many themes are available, but there's a hundred different themes you can choose from. You may be thinking, what makes a theme quote unquote accessibility ready? According to the WordPress theme review handbook, it must include at least the following. One, make sure someone only using a keyboard can use, the, can use the website. Number two, make sure anyone who uses a screen reader can identify what is a button, what is a link, and what is something for them to fill in. Number three, make sure it includes a skip link so that the screen readers can skip the menu of the website. Now that you have a theme, you want to start thinking about headings and paragraphs. H1, or known as head one, should be used once per page. It is used to identify what the page is about. This allows the site to be organized and makes it easier for everyone to understand what is important and what is also important on the website. Something we should all consider is what language is on the website. I'm not talking about English 
or friendship, but the burden is something that you want those who read the website to understand. You can think about it as how technical or non-technical do you want the site to be. For example, since this is a talk meant for beginners, I'm trying to use simple and plain language so everyone can understand what I'm saying. If you have a site that is meant for beginners or meant for everyone, consider using plain language. What is often on every website is images. This can be great to break up all of that text on the website. However, you want to make sure that those images are accessible. That means adding something called alt text to the images. Alt text is used to describe the image to someone who can't see it. It can be hard to write alt text at first. One suggestion I have is close your eyes and try to remember what is important in that image. Then write the alt text around that. You get better writing it over time. Every single website also has color. Color could just be black and white, or you can add many, many colors to it. However, you want everything on your site to be able to be read by anyone. To ensure this, you want to have a contrast between the different wording on the website. The very minimum you want is three to one for large text and 4.5 to one for paragraph text. As always with accessibility, the higher the number, the better. Now, you may be thinking, what is this color contrast I'm talking about? The simplest definition I have found is, quote, a measurement of the difference in perceived brightness between two colors end quote. Now, how do you check if what the color contrast is between your background and the text you actually have on the website? My favorite website is Web AIM's Contrast Checker, but there are also many other tools and websites which offer this. So find one that suits you best. There are also a million different fonts to choose from. However, when you think about accessibility, you have to be careful with which font you choose. I want you to think for a moment about which fonts you have seen on websites and are they accessible or not. Got some themes in your, you got some, got some text in your head? You think about, okay, what's accessible, what's not? You're probably hoping that I could just list off a number of different fonts for you to choose or theme to choose or whatever. There isn't one or two or five that could be considered the best. While many sites offer different suggestions, I would encourage you to find some that fit you and your website or your business the best. You also, for fonts, you want to limit the number of different fonts you use. Try to limit that the three or less. With it now being easy to read and a theme that's accessible, you want to make sure there's enough spacing between the text on the side, between the letters and the paragraphs. That way, the reader can know if the word is card or cool. You want to make sure that the font is also big enough for somebody to read. The general suggestion is to start, start at 16 pixels and work your way up. You also may be reading text at 100% zoom or the regular zoom. However, there are people who increase that font for many, many, many reasons. You want to ensure that your font can still be read and your wording at 200% zoomed in. This is because you want to make sure that the text doesn't lose, lose any content or functionality. Many websites love to include audio or video. And while they can look great, 
they can be an accessibility nightmare. Yeah, they seriously can. Make sure nothing plays unless the person viewing the website wants it to play. If you include audio or video, then make sure to include closed captions or audio describe what is happening. Have you ever been to many websites and thought, wow, all those links look very similar across multiple websites? Why is that? Because the general suggestion is to distinguish what is a link and what isn't. The most common way to do this is have the link be blue in color and have it be underlined. Now it stands out and the person on the website knows what is a link and what isn't. If you said it had blue text color, don't use blue as the link. Use a different color. Another way to make sure your links are accessible is by describing what they do. Don't use the words learn more or click here. Use something like you can rent a tour or learn more about a favorite pasta. It helps to differentiate what the different things are. <laughs> Accessibility is also making sure anyone in the world can visit the website in the first place. This means making your website load as quickly as possible. The best practice now seems to be three seconds or less. If you unsure how quickly or how slowly the website loads. There are many websites which lets you test that. My personal favorite is webpagetest.org. Of course, the length of time also depends on where in the world the website is located and the visitor is located. Accessibility also means making sure the site looks good on a computer as well as a mobile device like a phone. Have you tested how your site looks on the phone? Maybe not, because you could be losing an additional 30% of your potential customers if it doesn't look good. That is more customers. I know I have talked a ton and I include so much information. What you have to remember is what may work for one person may not work for somebody else. This is not meant to be an end all and a perfect guide to making your website 100% accessible. It's a guide to make your website more accessible. If you want to see how your website looks against some accessibility standards, then there are many website accessibility evaluation tours like WebIM's one over at wave.webaim.org to close. There can be a ton that can be done to make a website accessible. And I've only just covered the service level stuff, like theme, heading, language, images, color, fonts, audio and video, and links, just to name a few. If you missed anything that I talked about, my slides are available for viewing and downloading at your own pleasure and convenience at bit.ly forward slash WPAD 2022. I would also like to thank the organizing team of WordPress Accessibility Day for everything they have done that you may see or may not have seen. If you have any questions about what I talked about, the most convenient way for me is to contact me through any of the links like my email address or social media that are available on my website. My website is gregoryhammond.ca. Now, call to action. Get out there and make your website more accessible. Our next talk in this session is You, Me, and Your Content I Can't See presented by Amy Carney. Amy is an accessibility specialist and web developer at Digiloo. 
There will be no Q&A during this lightning round, but please use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. Amy is here in the chat and can answer your questions there. I'm Amy Carney, and I'm an independent web designer and developer and accessibility consultant. In my talk, you, me, and your content I can't see, I want to share with you about my disability, how I customize my devices, and what barriers I've encountered on the web, and suggestions on how you can help. So I was born visually impaired. I choose that label for myself because it was the one I was given in childhood and it's the one best suiting how I fit this visual world. I'm not blind legally and medically. I don't qualify as legally blind or even low vision, but I can easily get a doctor's note when I feel accommodations are necessary. I've never lost vision. I've been given what I've been given. If anything, I've been given more, but it's fragile. I rely on my glasses. My thick lenses are a daily reminder of the two worlds I live in, abled and disabled. My glasses are my core assistive technology, you could say. They keep my foot in the visual world and maintain the illusion that I'm abled. Rather than go into the medical specifics, I'd much rather describe what my vision is like. One eye is foggy. I can't read with it. I can't even distinguish details with it. Color and movement are definitely my allies. It really throws a wrench into my depth perception and allows people to sneak up on me on that side. My other eye's perception field is limited by my glasses. Everything outside of my lens is foggy, even with the lens. I don't have usable vision for the entire lens because I have bifocals, a reading lens and a distance lens vie for that space. And as the lens tapers off, so the prescription tapers off for the magnification strength I need. So truly I, I look through a small focal point in my lens for clarity and focus. Thanks to surgeries and how my eye anatomy is, I'm light sensitive, so bright light environments can give me headaches. To add to it, my eyes move back and forth involuntarily. They're trying to gather as much visual information around as possible, but ironically, that can make focusing on things tricky. I rely heavily on color, contrast, and movement with my clear eye to be able to see as well as my foggy eye. In the offline world, sound and touch are critical for understanding what I'm seeing. So how do I, as a visually impaired person, survive in such a visually heavy world? I join tech. Computers accommodate me without me having to ask. At a hardware level, I can use bigger monitors. I use devices that have the accessibility options that I need, which I'll discuss soon. Um, I allow my devices to talk to each other. So thank you very much, Apple ecosystem. At a system level, I can enlarge the text size. I can change the color scheme, whether it be high contrast mode, which my preference is yellow on black, or I could do dark mode. I decrease the screen resolution to make things bigger. I make icons bigger. I magnify in the full screen. Um, I show text on hover like a tooltip when I hover, uh, run my mouse pointer over something like an image or text. It'll, read, it'll show the text in larger print or even show me the alt text of an image. I have text spoken aloud to me by the computer. It's not a screen reader, it's just a speak feature to do whether a paragraph or a whole page. I enlarge my mouse cursor size and also customize it so it's yellow to contrast on my dark mode black. 
I navigate by keyboard. Um, I am a keyboard and mouse user. I use the keyboard as much as possible because there's a certain tactileness to it and I can know where I'm at. But I use mouse just because that's how things are more easily reachable. So it really depends on the context. But I know a whole lot of shortcuts for my keyboard just to make things easier for me. For notifications, I receive alerts through sound and flashing. So sometimes I can catch a notification coming out of the corner of my screen or above my screen. For my laptop, um, I prefer a sound to go off so I know it's there. And when I have things magnified, my screen will flash once to let me know I got a notification. Additionally, I increase contrast for my system just a little bit, but enough to make things stand out a little more. At a browser level, I can zoom in. Um, to be clear, I really only zoom in about 115 to maybe 130% max because I have a lot of things changed already at the system level. So I'll zoom in just a little bit more on the browser. I often switch to reader mode, especially for blogs and long articles. I'm a Firefox user on my laptop, which has reader mode and allows me to use white text on black. It also has an audio feature that will read text aloud to me. On my iPhone, I have Safari as my browser and that has a reader mode as well and lets me do the same thing. Additionally, in the browser, I consider the search text tool as an accessibility tool for me. I can press Control F and then I can quickly find the information I'm looking for, especially on articles I've read before. And I don't, it doesn't have to be a tedious task to be able to find what I read. So what prevents me from reading your content? Well, when things are fixed on the screen, a nav bar, a footer, uh, God forbid both fixed on the screen, it narrows down my reading field. And think about how you read things. And you're, you're really skimming, aren't you? Your eyes kind of skip around in a pattern. You're looking for keywords. Um, you don't just slowly read text. And with that in mind, sometimes I'm limited to three lines at a time on my laptop, and that's a 16 inch screen. So that can get very fatiguing to be able to read a minimal amount of text at a time when I'm not even enlarging it more than 115%. It's ridiculous. Ellipsis, hidden content, uh, three dots. People like to hide content because they like their neat little cards or boxes of information with a fixed width and height. And oftentimes that information isn't available beyond those three dots. There's no link to go to read more elsewhere. There's, there's not a pop-up. Um, it doesn't expand. It's just gone. And that's terrible when I enlarge my text. The more I have my text enlarged, whether at the system level or even browser level, more content disappears and I can't ever get to it. It's a true blocker. Um, other problems that come along with fixed width and height uh, for boxes and cards and such, uh, even half bars sometimes, is that um, content will tend to overlap. It's not allowing text to push the container size. And so when it starts overlapping, it makes things unreadable. I see this a lot in nav bars sometimes too, because people think it has to be a certain size. Um, on that note, mobile apps in particular that don't adapt into from portrait to landscape. Um, when I like to read longer text, I like to go into landscape mode when there's more information to read. So it creates a better flow, more words per line for me, despite my text size. And when I don't have a landscape option, the reading feels very choppy or again sometimes things will start to overlap um, bright white backgrounds uh, that stark white and the fading text um, can be really hard um, when you dampen that a little bit it helps but bright bright whites uh, especially when i'm functioning off of dark mode it could be very jarring small unscalable text um, it's astounding to me in 2022 that 
people are still creating font size with pixels when it needs to be more flexible than that and respect people's settings with more relative units. Poor contrast, that's still a big one. This whole gray text on white is um, really tough. And I've seen a lot where borders of things aren't enough contrast. So even when I increase my contrast, they've kind of fade away. And so I can't see where my input box is at. It's weird, very confusing because I can't find the input box. And lastly, overlays, any type of overlay, um, back to top links that are fixed at the bottom, oftentimes those will cover up part of the text, chatbot bubbles, uh, video ads, because <laughs> those actually tend to cover up my whole content. Um, social media links, when those are fixed to the side, they will literally cover um, a chunk of the paragraph that I can't read the paragraph even though I'm scrolling through because they're stacked. Um, and then accessibility widgets that are supposed to be helpful, but they are counterproductive. Um, I've tried experimenting with, this, with those to see if increasing text size would be good, um, but instead it ends up smashing things together because the layout doesn't reflow. Um, the contrast doesn't always work out because it's not thought out. And so sometimes links will not have a good contrast color, even though regular text might have the white or the yellow on black. So those kind of things um, aren't very helpful to someone like me at all. Just let me use what I'm doing with my system and my browser settings. So despite this longest of things, uh, you're probably either feeling overwhelmed, like how can I tackle these each of these things, but I want to encourage you not to overthink what you need to do for this. I've shared these details about my experiences, my disability problems I've had um, to help you understand that I don't fit into a neatly wrapped visually disabled box, but each bullet point I've shared shouldn't be addressed as an entire checklist of things for you to go through. Um, I wanna encourage you that if you're following the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, you're actually going to uh, fulfill my wish list of things that I'd like to see better about the web because they um, advocate for me in that way. So here's what I want. I want text that's scalable, um, relative units, not fixed units. I want colors that respect my scheme preferences. If you have taken the time to create a dark mode theme, that's wonderful. I appreciate that. Um, but if I'm using Windows high contrast mode, I want to be able to see outlines and SVGs. It's amazing how many times those things disappear if I switch over to Windows high contrast mode. Um, I'd also like to see light backgrounds that don't overwhelm or fatigue me or give me a headache. I want strong color contrast between the text doing borders, outlines, background. Um, I appreciate that people try to be meet uh, success criteria for the 4.5 to one, but sometimes I need it to pop a little bit more, especially with the way I do my custom settings on my machines. So if you can make it pop a little bit more, I'd like to see that. Um, I need reader mode compatibility. I think WordPress, uh, themes often are reader mode compatible, so I can go to somebody's WordPress blog and I'll be able to um, toggle over to reader mode. But there are still quite a few news websites out there and other people's blogs that I'm still stuck with their choices and not my choices. Flexible layouts. I need things to expand and reflow when my text is bigger. Regardless of what I've chosen for my system's resolution and text settings, um, I want to be able to read the content. I want it to not overlap or disappear. Uh, next, I need strong visible focus indicators. So as I'm a heavy keyboard user, I want to be able to see um, where my focus is at, especially when I'm filling out a form or even see where the link is if I'm tabbing through something that has a lot of links or the navigation. I need decent white space. 
some visual breathing room on the page, you know, not too tight, but not too sparse. I need a little bit of room. I also would like to see all mobile apps be able to use landscape and portrait. That's the right thing to do because I need that on a lot of things. I, I cannot see any reason immediately <laughs> why there would only be portrait view for any app. I, as I mentioned earlier, please no sticky objects on the page. You get rid of that chat box, you know, that pops up, but you know, open it up somewhere else or have the, uh, the round button somewhere else that I could just get to maybe in the navigation bar. Stop sticky navigation. I promise you I can find your navigation and I have a keyboard shortcut for that. I can find what I need. So please stop sticking things in the way of the content that you want me to read. And lastly, don't use accessibility overlays. They are completely useless to me. They are counterproductive and they usually don't work. They work against the settings that I already have. So that's all I've got to share today. I hope you found it useful. If you have questions, you could find me on Twitter. I'm very active on there at Click to Carney, C L I C K, the number two, C A R N E Y, or on GitHub at Digilu, D I G I L O U. If you're curious about how I started out learning about web accessibility, check out my blog at 100daysofa11y.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you'll join me in making a better web for everyone. And our third and final session in this lightning round is video captioning and transcript tricks with Melanie Hawks. Melanie is the video and media assistant for the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia. As a reminder, there will be no Q&A official during this lightning round, but please use the ideas section to chat with the other attendees. And Melanie is here in the chat and can answer your questions. Hello, I'm Melanie from the Department of Fire and Emergency Services in Western Australia. I'll be talking to you about captioning tips and tricks to make captioning easier and faster. So why caption video content? Because providing captions and a transcript of audio and visual material is required to pass Level A of the WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It doesn't only benefit people with disabilities. Many people don't have sound on while scrolling social media, for example. They might be in a really noisy place, like a bus or a train, and they prefer to read the captions while they watch the video. They may not have their headphones on, and it helps people who are learning English as a second language as well. And if you rely on auto captions, you may not get the message you intended. These are some of my favorite bloopers from Auto English on YouTube. Searching for lots of engine people, should have been. Searching for lost and injured people. What laser head, should have been what laser head. And BBC's Michael finds pleasure in triple slow, should be. If you see smoke or flames, please ring triple zero. Here in the emergency services, it's really important that we get the message across. It could be a matter of uh, saving people's lives but also to avoid embarrassment. Can you imagine if your CEO, or in our case, our commissioner, was captioned in one of these on the left when he should have been speaking something on the right? It will save a lot of embarrassment if you actually caption it correctly. So how do I caption? Well, I use in, uh, YouTube. So you've uploaded your video in YouTube. Now you go to subtitles on the left. The auto English captions have already been generated. So click duplicate and edit, then continue. I like to edit timings as I go, rather than edit a block of text. So you click edit timings, then you start editing. 
check the words are accurate and align with the audio. You can adjust the text box on the timeline by dragging the ends, making it longer or shorter. You want to break in the natural pauses of the audio. Hi, my name's Ronnie. I'm with Marine Rescue Geraldton and I've been a volunteer here for about four years. If the text boxes are side by side and you want to combine them, you can press the backspace key. To split them, put the marker in the break between audio segments and press enter. It's a real time saver doing it that way. You should make the two lines of text even length. Do this by pressing shift and enter. And I always delete spaces on the ends of the lines. Here I'm editing a three minute video, so I'll speed this up. You need to check spelling, capital letters, add punctuation, etc. It's slow and time consuming, but it's worth it. I'm Wayne Harson. I'm Deputy Commander, also skipper and crew on boat. Here there is a change of speaker in the video. It's important you note that with a symbol of some kind. I use two greater than arrows before they speak. You can use something else as long as you're consistent. If the speaker reappears later, I use the symbols again plus their name in square brackets. Even though these two lines appear even on the video screen, I split them anyway. If someone watches this on a wider screen, it will display differently if you don't split them. Never go to three lines. Try and find a spot to cut it if it's too long. Always spell in the language of your audience. For example, meters in Australia is M-E-T-R-E-S, so I'll change it from the American spelling here. So that's it. I've made it to the end of the video. Now I go back to the beginning and watch it again to make sure it's all good and I haven't missed anything. But to save time today, I'll skip this part. Right, so I'm back at the end. I'm happy with what I've done. So now you click publish. Then we can delete the auto English captions file. and download our edited captions as an SRT file. Choose a folder and click save. That's captioning complete. 
Now we can use that SRT file to write a transcript. Open it in Notepad, select all and copy. Then I open this handy little website that converts the SRT file to text. Paste it in at the top, click convert at the bottom. It strips out all the numbers and formatting for you. Then I like to change it to the line merger feature here, so it's all in one paragraph. Then we copy that output, open up a Word document. I'm going to open an old transcript and save it as a new one. Then I delete everything except the heading. and paste the transcript. Then I add a title. And then we add the details in, like the name of the person speaking, any text on the screen, make paragraphs, etc. While listening to the video, you might find that you've made a mistake. So because we've made a change to this transcript, we have to reflect that change in the subtitles on YouTube. So you can just go edit here and make that change. You can also change it in the SRT file that we downloaded. Our video had text on the screen at the beginning, so don't forget to add any text that your video might have on the screen. And there we have it, come to the end. Don't forget to make your document accessible. Add any headings. And that's it complete. Save it then as a PDF. And then we have an online portal where we can upload these documents on our intranet. But you can use SharePoint or OneDrive or something similar.
then copy the link and I create a big link for both files. Copy that. and paste it into the description box on YouTube. That way people watching the video can download the transcript if they wish. And you've passed the triple A level of WCAG accessibility online for video content. Altogether, this process took me just over an hour, which I think is pretty good for a three minute video. Don't forget to save and thanks so much for watching. I hope I've given you some knowledge and you'll be able to do that on your videos from now on. All right, thank you for attending this lightning session with Gregory Hammond, Amy Carney, and Melanie Hawks. You can continue the conversation in the chat or on social media using hashtag WPA11YDay and hashtag WPAD2022. We also appreciate it if you go to wpaccessibility.day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentation. A quick note on our next um, session, you're gonna need to refresh your page in order to um, view the next set of sessions. Um, it'll be the alt scene, when and how to write alternative text with Meg Miller. That's coming up at 3 a.m. UTC, 10 p.m. Central. While you're waiting, don't forget to visit our sponsors' pages to grab virtual swag and enter for a chance to win great prizes. We'll see you right here after the break, and don't forget to refresh your page when you come back. <laughs>